Legends Global Series. Our split one playoffs are just around the corner, but before we get to land, we need to find out which teams will be participating in split two of year four, which leads us to today with our Pro League qualifier matches. My name is Glitter Explosion, and I'll be your host here today. And you know, when it's a match point day, we bring in even more of our amazing casters. So today, we have Onset, Gaskin, and Vicky Kitty joining us all day. Onset, I know it's been a while, but we're back with more Apex action. So how are you feeling? I'm feeling good. I'm waving to the people at home as well because it does feel like it's been quite a while since we've been out talking about some Apex Legends. We've obviously got the Split 1 playoffs just around the corner in LA. We're all looking forward to that. I certainly have the Sun Tan Lotion packed and ready to go, but this is where we decide who's going to be part of Split 2, right? We get the PLQ, we find out who's going to be joining the Pro Leagues, and it's going to be a lot of fun and uh, a ruckus, I think, is a good way, way to describe it. A ruckus is a great way to describe it. I might have to use it at some point here today. But Dan, we're going to be seeing lots of new teams in Split 2 after today. So are you excited for those new faces? Very excited, but also concerned. In my tweet, I literally used the word ruckus, and now I feel like I need to copyright it because Mark's <laughs> taking it away from me. Uh, I, I can't wait, though. Challenger teams will always kind of cause that ruckus that he's speaking of because it's something a little bit different. It's teams that are hungry, teams that want it. And I think we are going to see a few upsets today. Yeah, definitely lots for these teams to prove here today. But last and certainly not least, Vicky, are you ready for the chaos, the ruckus, the excitement that today is sure to bring and the boys keep mentioning? Listen, I, I think the only thing causing a ruckus is this crew right here. No, but I am very excited to see how a lot of these teams play out, especially seeing that we perhaps may have less pro league teams that we had from our actual pro league in the ALGS now competing for these qualifiers. So I'm excited to see how it's going to fare off against a lot of these other squads. Yeah, it's definitely going to be an opportunity for some of these teams to make a mark for themselves here, kind of set the stage for what people can potentially expect out of them heading into Split 2. And they've had a lot of time to prepare for the competition here today, Mark. So hopefully everyone's got their ducks in a row and they're ready to go. Yeah, I mean, this isn't the, the only time these guys and girls have been playing, right? This has been a long process to get to this lobby. So everybody is going to be fairly familiar with each other in the lobby. There's always the discussion about who's going to be dropping where. Are we going to see some contests? Our team's going to start griefing each other because it's a PLQ. Sometimes you see that kind of stuff going down. It's like, well, this team killed us earlier. They threw our game. They may be on match point, but we know those skins. So we're going to throw our game and try and kill it. All of that stuff could happen. You never know. That's what the excitement of the PLQ is all about. Yeah, and, and speaking of those drops, I mean, Vicky, they've had a little bit of time, at least in the past few days of competition, to try and get that information. But things can always change. So these teams really need to be adaptable in the situations here today. Yeah, they've played eight games in the last two or three days now. So now with match point final, it's a lot for a lot of these teams to figure out what they've needed to iron out before diving into the day that actually matters. All right. Now, we keep mentioning that this is the Pro League qualifier, but it's just the tiniest bit different from our normal format. So in case you're new here and you don't know how all this works, let's break it down for you just a little bit. Now, we started with 30 teams. Those 30 teams were made up of the bottom eight teams from Pro League and the top 22 teams from our Challenger circuit. Now, those teams have already been battling it out for a couple days now. Yesterday, they did three eight-match series, and between Friday and Saturday, We've already made it between made it through our winners one our elimination round one and our winners round two Which now leads us to today for our pro league qualifier match point finals Now our match point format is something that you all should be familiar with by now But if you're not all it means is that the teams will receive points for each match And then the first team to hit that 50 point threshold and then win a game after hitting it wins the entire competition now one important point here is that we will be playing at least six matches even if someone wins match points before then now this is because there are eight spots available so we want to make sure our teams have enough time and enough matches to fight for those spots in the next split and we've never seen this happen before in a blq though so just something to be aware of now another thing to note is that the top 10 from winners two will have advanced starting points based off of where they placed in winners two and finally the top eight will secure their spot in the pro league for split two now, a lot happened during these previous stages of the Pro League competition, and some familiar faces from our Pro League have already been eliminated and therefore relegated from Split 2. These teams are TSM Phoenix, Mind, and 202 teams. We've definitely spoken a lot during the Split 1 season, so this is kind of a surprise here, Vicky. 
Yeah, especially TSM Phoenix. I'm not too sure what happened in that elimination round one. I don't believe Kyrie was playing with this team. She's usually their heavy fragger, so having her absent there means that there's probably going to be some changes going into that roster. We're going to have to wait and see where they're standing here. But even seeing Mind and 202 not making it, it, it means that this opens up new spots for new teams to come into the Pro League. Now, we're going to be able to take a look at the rest of the teams who are participating here to do. And as we do that, I also want to start talking about some of them. We obviously have recognizable names on this list, whether that's our pro league teams who are hoping to keep their spot in split two or winners from our previous challenger circuits. Mark, I want to hear from you first on this one, though. Which of these teams have caught your attention that you think we need to be paying attention to? Well, there's a couple of teams I want to talk about in particular. There's obviously, like you say, some uh, some familiar names that a lot of people who have watched the EMEA Pro League are going to know, they're going to love and know what to expect from them. But you're looking at these two rosters here. These are two rosters who are looking to bounce back, right? You've got uh, Danis, which is Young Hong Kong, Fricks and Sherbert. They finished in 25th, so they were five po spots or so outside of those relegation spots and unfortunately had to go through the PLQ to find themselves in this final lobby. Apex Warlords had a little bit of an up and down se season, but it was mostly down, to be honest with you, as 29th is where where they ended up in the overalls. Uh, Genji, Shiv, and Zerifer are going to be playing today. Obviously, Mandy was on that roster, but he's going to be stepping down. So it's their opportunity here to kind of get themselves back where they feel like they belong and have another shot here in uh, Split 2. Yeah, teams that we know really well, so we'll definitely be keeping our eyes on them. But Gaskin, I want to pose the same question to you. Tell me about some of the other squads on that list that you want to keep your eyes on as well. Is the squads from the Challenger circuits. We have three squads who were able to win the series throughout the Challenger circuit. Trojan, who did it in Challenger circuit two. NPC did it in Challenger circuit one. And Red Dragon, who did it in Challenger circuit four. The most recent one, in fact. Three incredible squads, most notably Taskmaster featuring Red Dragon. We've been speaking about Taskmaster for years, about his individual capability and also what he brings to a team. That's the one team I'm most excited about. My worry for all three of these squads is can they get the victories in match point? Looking across their performance in Challenger Circuit and in the PLQ so far, there are a couple of wins here or there, but not as many as you would expect for a team that could win in match point format. But definitely squads we have to keep an eye for. They are going to make a real damage in this lobby. Some really nice points on those teams as well. And Vicky, any final points that you want to make on some of these teams? Just last little tidbits that you might want people to be paying attention to? I mean, looking at winners round one and two, we talked about the eight game triumph that a lot of these teams had to battle out in and team rolling teams and team call me data actually were two very consistent teams that I would recommend everyone to keep their eyes on because it's going to get pretty interesting diving into that first game. Yeah, this is why we keep telling everyone at home to be keeping your eyes peeled for all of the action that's going to happen because I think it's going to be really exciting. We've got loads of great teams competing here today, but if we didn't mention one of your favorites, well, we have another way for you to keep up with them. You need to be checking out our Face It watch stream, okay? Because it has everything you could possibly need. Not only can you watch up to four team POVs simultaneously, but we'll also have a dedicated map POV and lots Live team comms with an audio mixer that allows you to balance the audio the way that you want to hear it, which is unheard of. One of the coolest things we've done here so far. And then to top it all off, there's also a built-in ALGS calendar so that you can pull up a schedule for all of the upcoming matches, and that way you won't miss a single second of the action. It's a very, very cool way to watch ALGS, so make sure that you check it out. And once you guys get all that set up, pick your teams and have those ready to go, we will get you into the action here in just a few short moments. But I've gotten to check in with everybody except you, Dan, on uh, kind of overall feelings on what to expect. I know I asked you that at the top of the show, but specifically, we keep talking about how this could be a little bit different from what people see in Pro League versus what we're going to get bringing in these challenger circuit teams to the mix. So talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I think the difficulty for teams is going to be finding consistency in a lobby that's going to have a, an element of randomness, an element of teams who might just disrupt the standard way of playing Apex because Challenger Circuit teams are going to introduce that. It's going to be new, excited teams who want to change things, want to do things a little bit different, maybe have been practicing in a different way, maybe are used to playing slightly different lobbies. So teams who have been performing in the Pro League, the likes of Danish, for example, who have a lot of victories, 
they should be one of the favorites, but perhaps there's going to be a team that might be on their loop path. Perhaps there's going to be a team who might disrupt their rotations a little bit, and they have to be mindful of that. They have to assess the lobby, and I think a lot of the more experienced teams will learn how these lobbies go a lot quicker, and maybe that's something that some of the challenger teams might struggle with. They might perform well in the early games, but as the games go on, as we get further into match point, that's when I'm expecting the teams that were in Pro League to really shine. Yeah, and that's why we do these PLQ matches to see, <clears throat> excuse me, which of our teams deserve to be in the next split because the action's only going to get harder as we continue throughout our competitive year. But we keep talking about it. Match number one should be ready to go, which means it's time to kick things off. So onset, Gaskin, let's get into it. Let's do it. I'm ready for this, Dan. I don't know about you, mate. It feels like forever since we've done this. Do you know what I mean? I, it just feels like there's been such a... a, a kind of a, not just a wait but like an impatient wait is how i felt this the plq is like perfectly timed just before split split one playoffs as well because it means that we get to get back into the swing of things get to see a little bit more apex of course there was a patch between the last time that we saw the teams play and now where some legends kind of power curve has been adjusted a little bit to in my opinion make a bit more sense for some of those legends so all those little things have come in as well which gives us a little taster right ahead of the split uh, one playoffs and also, I think it's just wonderful to see everybody having to go through the ringer here before we decide who's going to be in the Split 2 Pro League as well. I think it's going to be a great day of action. Yeah, PLQ is always an interesting one because you have the disappointment of the eight teams who were essentially put into relegation and the big question, can they regain their place in Pro League? And then you get all the challenger teams who are biting at the bit, desperate to chomp on the heels of all these players and try and steal that spot away from them. And you've got to look at who wants it more, who's been putting in the time, who's been practicing more, because sometimes it is those challenger teams. They're the ones who have been reformed. They've been remade to try and beat the teams that are coming down from Pro League. And that's why we see some players we know very well we spoke about taskmaster the fact he's now come onto this red dragon squad a different red dragon squad that we saw in pro league to avoid any confusion but they are definitely one of the favorites here today and i think that's exciting for a challenger team to be a favorite during plq i love the fact in the plq as well is this like there's this element of unpredictability right because when we watch Pro League week after week, we know what groups to expect, which means that teams know what groups they're going to be going up against, which we know what teams are going to be contesting certain POIs, which rotations teams are going to be running into. And like you quite rightly mentioned, there's going to be some unpredictability with teams on their rotates because even out of the dropship, you know, is your POI, POI going to be safe? Even if there's an agreement in the lobby beforehand, you might have to fight a couple of times to make sure that it is. And as the games go on, if a team knows you're on match point, are they going to try and cut you down on that rotate? Is there going to be a team who maybe shouldn't be where you expect them to be? And all of a sudden you're taking a fight a little bit earlier when you're on your way to pick up a few Evo caches. It's all these kind of things which just make, I think, the the team who's going to have the most potential to win this thing today is adaptability right you've got to be able to adapt to fights that happen when you don't expect them to disengage from areas where you don't expect there to be fights going on it's all these decisions that have to be made on the fly and i think a lot of pressure on igls today in comparison to say fraggers because fraggers their job's going to be the same right when a fight happens you got to get those kills but for an igl to navigate unpredictable traffic it's going to be rough today and I think it's interesting because there will be teams who haven't played in a lobby together today because there were teams who got a buy into winner's bracket round two and there will be teams that dropped into elimination bracket but then still got through to the finals here today. So we are going to have to see match one here where people will literally be fighting for their drop spots. Yes, you get the kind of gentleman's agreement that comes through sometimes where these players will discuss who's going to be dropping where, but it's not always a nice thing. It's not always people playing nice and we might see a couple of scraps early on, but we're in the fly through now. The teams are ready. Legend selection has happened so it's time to get going here in the plq and we're starting off on world's edge we're going to be doing two maps uh time so it'll be uh two maps of world's edge and then we move on to storm point is my understanding as we move through match point and of course the fact that it is match point is one of the craziest things right because like you say winning games is tough in these lobbies where there's unpredictability but knowing that there's going to be match point as well and a lot of teams who haven't won games and been consistent in winning those games it means we could have a huge amount of games today i feel like i said just games like a thousand times in that sentence but you know you know what i'm coming from it could be a long day Games are important. It's why I was talking about the wins as well. When we look at a team like NPC, for example, they won Challenger Circuit number one, but they've yet to find a victory here in PLQ from 16 games. You look at a team like Danish, though, they've got two wins from eight. That percentage record looks a lot better when you look at a team that could be winning on match point compared to another. 
Well, World's Edge is going to be the stage for where we start things off today. A reminder of match point, if you're watching for the first time as well, the first team to hit 50 points will be match point eligible. And then it's all about winning a game after that from that position. If a couple of teams hit 50 points, it's the first one out of the two to get that win. Essentially, you've got to see that champion's banner to call yourself the winner here. But like we mentioned as well, even if the games get done before... Uh, the final allotted amount of games that we have today. We will play those games out to make sure that the final spots are decided in the fairest way possible. So, off the rip here, just looking at the top right to see if there's any guns being fired and any players been dropping. It looks like everyone is pretty safe for their drops down. Yeah, pretty safe. That's always a good scenario. We're on board with Free Sosa at the moment. They finished second in the elimination bracket round one. So even though they got knocked down into that elimination bracket, they certainly found their comfort zone once they were in that uh, scenario. But we're going very much northwest up towards Trials. So this is going to be great for OR9. Danish are in a good spot. Forbidden as well. And even Meow, you can see, are already moving from Skyhook because they had Ring Console. They are going to be able to move as quickly as they would like to where they like and probably going to get priority here yeah danish also have ring console as well so they're gonna be able to get there the only problem for danish maybe is just the pathing to get evo right because it doesn't look like there's really anywhere for them to grab any evo caches so it might be a case of I maybe mean, leaving with blues but when you get towards the later game as we know with the change in the system that we've seen the evo system you know late game blues is well you get late game blues it's pretty simple as you're getting run over by people approaching a little bit later with purples at a minimum and sometimes even those red evo armors but this is kind of my team to watch i would say as a team who are gonna guarantee points i think on a game to game basis from their fragging power and that's gonna be red dragon we mentioned you know taskmaster a former aurora player you know we know all about aurora and he was the guy a lot of the time who was put in positions to put up numbers and i think if he can pop off today and do what he does best then they might be a team who are chasing down 50 points first and of course, there's still a reason why he's performing. His teammates doing a great job alongside him as well. And a composition that we're going to see a lot of today. Bangalore, Bloodhound, Caustic. Uh, expect to be seeing plenty of that, especially on World's Edge. They finished third in winner's bracket round two yesterday. They only had the one victory across the eight games, but 66 points. So certainly still something very impressive. And if you can find that points total quickly here in match point, then you can put yourself in the best position to potentially get the victory here today. But as a challenger team, there's always going to be that question that is... Will they flop when you get to the final lobby? Is there going to be pro league teams that will maybe shut them down when it gets a little bit further? But I believe that Red Dragon have a real shot here to not only That's qualify for pro league, but win the entire thing. Well, Danish are in a really good spot here. You can see that they've managed to get underneath trials and it looks like they control the inside of it. They've also got the uh, the composition to make sure that they can control space with the Caustic. Frick's going to be playing that legend, of course, which is one of those legends that did have that little bit of an adjustment to those perks. Now the Nox Grenade. Um, diameter or circumference, whatever you want to say, the amount of space that you hit with it, the upgrades, you know, mass. Again, why am I going this early with mass? We know it never goes well, but you got to wait till you get to purple now. It's a purple perk, which means that the power curve isn't quite as early as it was previously, which means that Caustic doesn't have that early game fight influence that it once did. Danish were our winners yesterday, by the way, winners bracket round two. For those of you who weren't able to watch the PLQ uh, from Friday onward, they found two victories across the eight games, uh, 77 points in total. So arguably the favorites coming into this one. And they're in a good spot at the moment up towards trials. I think all the teams now are starting to hunker down and find a position in the northwest area. But there is still a lot of teams who are moving from the south on set who aren't going to be able to get there quick. As soon as they saw that circle pool, they knew this was going to be a long, treacherous journey. And we might see a few scraps happening in the kind of choke points when you are starting to move through the middle of the map. Landslide could certainly be one of them. But right now, teams are just posturing up against one another and making, the, making it known where they reside. But no one's really taking a fight. Yeah, I think oh. it's interesting as well. Deadfish going to be a <laughs> Deadfish. Brilliant team name. Love that. Uh, already uh, looking to just command a little bit of space as we do see our first team eliminated. It's going to be DN who do fall. As we also see Shiv and the boys having a little bit of a scrap as well in that kill feed. But something I do want to talk about a little bit is the, how the new Evo system... It makes zone, I would say, like going early to zone, seeing that you've got it on you if you have ring console or whatever, it's a little bit less of like a guarantee for points because you saw OR9, uh, right? They're up on the top of trials. They are in the best position, you would say, for the end game, but they've only got white armors because yeah. they haven't had the time to go and hit some evos, to, to level them up, whatever it might be. So if a team is going to hit a, a late evac, whatever it might be, or get that damage onto them and just see, hey, wait, they're only on blues. We have purples, reds. They can take that spot away. And you've really got to be 
I say a little bit more dynamic yeah, about holding down those positions, knowing that you only have white armor. You've got to look to output damage as much as possible, as well as seeing other opportunities to pick up kills. And that can affect your weapon choice as well when you are looting. And sometimes, yeah, you are the victim of whatever is available to you. But if you can find, you know, long distance weapons that can help you pick off just that little bit of damage as the game goes by, even though damage isn't the best way to level up Evo shields, it certainly is a way you can do it, especially in a lobby like this, where there are naturally going to be people progressing across the map that you might be able to get a few pop shots off. And, you know, it can be the difference. If you can get to a blue, if you are on white, it could be the difference with whether you survive later on in that game. Uh, but now a lot of teams are starting to get to these choke points that I was speaking about earlier. NPC, one of the first ones as they move through, but it looks like after they had a couple of pop shots, they realize they are ahead of some of the other teams that are progressing from the south, and they want to move a little bit faster. Trying to just get ahead of them, like you say. And Bangalore's going to allow them to do so. He's going to slow that team down, but they're going to try and push through it. And Roman here has got to do a little bit of damage with that vault in his hands to keep... His teammates in a position to be able to hit those batteries and get up to full health. So the battle for the towers actually looks like it's paying off for them as the Rolling Thunder, the ultimate coming in from the Bangalore, is going to get a knock onto Adam, who was just outside of this tunnel. So they should be able to reset pretty comfortably here. They do get the res, and it's a case of, hey, you have the tunnel, we'll get the res, we'll both coexist and live to fight another day. Yeah, had one of them gone down there, it would have been bad news. I mean, you still have the chance of 2v3ing in a tunnel like that when you've got that much of a kind of a choke point to hold, but sadly for the team that was trying to push up onto them, they weren't able to get that final bit of damage. But now we can see the last remaining teams progressing. Kneecap are going to be one of the last ones who are going to be going through the tunnel on that south side. You can see Red Dragon moving back down towards Landslide arguably to hit another ring console, maybe a survey beacon. That's going to be Evo progressing. We know what Taskmaster used to do when he competed on previous teams. He would go out. He would go into the, the fray of things to make sure they could get extra Evo, but it might be a situation where Kneecap can spot them here and maybe catch them off guard. I'm going to giggle, by the way, a few times today. I'm just saying to everyone who's watching, and you, of course, that if I like things like Kneecap, I don't know why that's funny to me, but it is. <laughs> You know what well, I mean? Well, we could have a fight of window cleaners versus kneecap, you know? It's just one of those days, is, and I'm okay with you're it. You're taking over play-by-play play at that point, all right? Because I'm not <laughs> going to be able to keep, it, keep a straight face. But looking at where the zone is going, you can see there for uh, Zone 3 info that it is going to be a trial zone. It looks like it might pull towards the back of it, and that's where Danish are as well. They would have been able to walk past all those Evo caches as well to pick that up. So they might be a little bit closer to purple than when they, than when they were the last time that we did check in on them. Shamani? Did I get that right? I think so. I'm going to give myself 10 points. Shamani are going to be just outside of countdown at the moment and uh, just between the choke of trials, just under the, uh, the big raven that's there as well. And it's a good spot to hold down. You can see they're going to be in not just this zone, but the one afterwards as well. And they're going to be uh, in control of kind of directing traffic, I would say. If they can hold down this spot and this choke, a lot of the teams who are trying to move through countdown and move in a little bit late, which there are three or four of at the moment are going to be in a position where they can put damage down to them. So Red Dragon going to be one of those teams, like we mentioned, who are moving through Countdown, and they're already up to purples. I don't know if there was enough inflection on the capital letters in Shimani of, like, the A and the M. It was you like... better then. It's almost like, Shimani! It's, all, you, it's, it's quite... It's like a song, right? You have to sing it a little bit, and maybe... They'll be singing it as they try to attack some of the other teams. But for now, again, everyone just being a bit cautious. First first lobby, first day, a little bit of nerves perhaps between some of the squads as you don't want to throw yourselves into a fight, get absolutely decimated, and then you're sat there thinking about it for the rest of the game. I like the position that Red Dragon are in at the moment. As you can see in the kill feed, Shiv has just got knocked. Of course, the Apex Warlords, they're called now, not 40% worse. Uh, perhaps they felt that team name was a bit of bad luck throughout Pro League. Hey, we've seen it a lot of times, right? A little team change team name change i should say can change the fortunes maybe that's gonna be like you say another example of it so king victor there by the way already up to red armor as we jump on to the warlords but the uh, man who is known as the warlord himself is gonna have to be rezzed for now and will be so a good job then coming in from xerifer as uh, genji's gonna take his time to slow down the push on the core stick again and it's gonna be the meta comp, so to speak. Bloodhound, Bangalore, and Caustic here on World's Edge, which we're going to see once again. And there's some understandable reasons for that. It seems to be very effective as we do currently see that a lot of these teams running it. it. kind of balances out the characters of not only the strengths of what you're running yourself, but also counteracts a lot of the abilities of some of the teams you're going up against. For example, Bangalore Smokes can be now navigated by the Bloodhound. And if you want to hold down position, you want to push on to someone, then Caustic does that for you. And Bangalore, of course... 
Yes, Bangalore. The smoke's a little bit better now, I would say. Even though they dissipate a little bit quicker. I would say the smoke's now as a rotation tool. A really, really important Trojan, by the way. Making a move here. Yeah, Trojan. Very low, but just able to get out of any sort of damage that was coming through. And they are able to get the bats. That's massive for them. If one of them again had fallen, this was going to be so detrimental. They are in a position where the circle is coming up towards them. They need to hold this position right now. They can't afford to give it up. And they may have to fight aggressively for it. That's why they keep peeking here. That's why they keep trying to do as much damage as possible. And that is a good amount with the devotion. Oh, Turbo Devo is a problem. Uh, we talk about the Turbo Havoc. We all know about that and how everybody's talking about it at the moment. But the Turbo Devo is still the Turbo Devo, and that's what it does. It rips through people. Unfortunately for Trojan, Remix Powers, by the way, no relation to Austin, has gone down in this fight, and Trojan going to have to back out here. Yeah, backing out at the moment, and sadly, Remix Powers is going to go down. So it is just going to be the two of them. They got aggressive. They did a lot of damage, but did they get overzealous? Did they kind of put themselves in a bad position there? That'll be the question they'll be asking themselves. But again, you can still hold as a two in a position like this. You need to be working together. Communication needs to be on point. You need to be facing at the same time. But sadly, they're going to have to play the rest of this game as a two. Yeah, the difficulty here for them as well is the caustic who went down. So now they don't have an ability to command space. It's going to be a case of just having to get damage. They get a peak. They're going to try and turn it into a 3v2. And they do get that first knock. So now it's a 2v2 once again. And I'll tell you what, Trojan are causing all sorts of problems for this team inside. They're going to be pushed. 100 isn't enough to get the knock. And now it's all down to Moising. Can he clutch up for his team? Aku's there to try and clean up some damage. But while all of this is being done, you, you have to think that a third party might be in the vicinity. Yeah. I'm looking at the map saying, is there anyone that could maybe look in it? Danish are in the area. Danish could potentially clean things up if they would like to try to, but it doesn't look like they're going to go for it. Elsewhere, you can see Deadfish, they're struggling, and they're likely going to be out here. The ring probably will do the last bit of damage to them, sadly, and it will do so. So Deadfish eliminated. Now 15 squads remaining. Just like that, we've lost four. Make it five teams. Call me Dada. Rolling teams. They're all going down here because the zone is forcing everyone together. Yeah, this is the zone causing the problems, right? Nobody wanted to make a move a little bit earlier. Now we're going to see uh, Danish, I believe this is, who are looking to clean up the damage, like you say, in the side of that tunnel, going back to the tower that they've been holding for the majority of this game. And this is, if you've watched any historical zones here at Trials, probably the best spot to be holding. Sometimes it pulls out towards those houses, the little building complex that we see to the north of World's Edge, but a lot of the time it's going to be finishing in and around where Danish find themselves right now. And we mentioned, I'm going to go for it, Shamani. Well, they're still inside of this choke and still trying to hold it down, but the zone has pulled away from them. Kneecap eliminated as well. I am having fun. Yeah, there is three teams here on this southeast side. You've got Free Sosa, you've got Shimani, and you have Red Dragon, who are all competing to try and push northward. And really, you've got to look at what damage is being done from the other teams, and if you can then kind of be an impact, if you can join that fight. But as I say that, Shimani have lost one, so they've got to be careful. Maybe just try and escape, because the zone is going to be closing very quickly, and there is a lot of ground to cover here, because you're heading far northwest, up towards where Danish were holding. Well, Red Dragon have managed to get the res and managed to get Taskmaster back into the game. He doesn't have any attachments, but he doesn't meet, need too many. His teammate has fallen, though, and you can see that Free Sosa are trying to move in on this damage, but Ozus with that havoc again causing all sorts of problems, and Free Sosa will be down. Red Dragon survived for now, and I mentioned how Taskmaster doesn't have any attachments. Well, he'll kill you for them. He'll take them off of you, and he'll put them on his guns himself. Fair play to Free Sosa, by the way. They're playing Wraith, Rampart, and Loba. That is not the meta comp that we're used to seeing. We said today might throw in a little spanner of the works, and we might see a few teams trying something new. That was very much different, but it didn't work out in the fight. Spanner of the works sounds Spanner like of the works is the new... It's the new name for Rampart's heirloom, is what it is. <laughs> It's now officially what it's called right here. Come Red Dragon, they're making the move and you can't let Taskmaster get back in the game because this is what he can do. Brilliant shots, but now the zone's going to be doing the damage as Taskmaster falls. It's just going to be one player left remaining from Red Dragon as again, more teams are falling. Urgency, NPC, and the window cleaners have fallen. Sadly, nothing left to clean, but Red Dragon still have one. Oh, the zone is going to be chunking though. And this will be the end, I think, of Red Dragon here. They're going to try and force their way in, but the zone is going to claim more victims as Beast of the Hump will be possible. But Aku's now going to be taken down by the zone. Everybody in Apex Legends, just so you know, the zone will close and do damage. I think that the uh, lobby at the moment is playing a little bit of a victim when it comes to that zone because it's doing more damage than it really should at this point in the game. 
Yeah, so Danish were in the most commanding position on this northwest side, and they will dominate this western side as well, taking down Forbidden. So now Danish own the entire west side of this mountain. On the other side, on the east side of the mountain, you've got Apex Warlords, Meow, and I think OR9, uh, OR9 and Atlas are still alive as well. So you've got four teams on the eastern side as Meow now trying to do that damage. This is a big fight around the caravan. Meow might be going meow in a second. That was terrible. I can do so much better. Rot, though, he's down to not a lot of HP, and he will be down into a death box. Seraphor will get that final kill, but Apex Warlords will also fall, and we're down to three, everybody. It's going to be Atlas, OR9, who have been on the top of trials for the entirety of this game, and, of course, Danish, who are commanding that tower, and Danish, as the zone pulls out towards essentially no man's land around the train tracks, yeah. they are still in the priority position because they have the height over the teams moving in. This should be Danish's game because now they just have to wait for OR9 to naturally push onto Atlas because there's nowhere else really OR9 can go. So as soon as that damage starts to come out, Danish just needs to join it at the right time and it should be a victory for them. But we have seen crazier things. If Atlas can somehow use one player to hold off Danish and the other two to hold off OR9, it is still winnable, but it is going to be a difficult game for sure. You also look at ultimates who has what available, right? And you saw the OR9 do not have the caustic ult available, which means they can't force away or force the two teams together and then use that to get the free damage they're looking for. And the, like you say, the two teams are now just forced together by the circumstances and the environment they find themselves in. Atlas down to two, but you're just waiting surely for Danish to move in and clean this up. Here they come. Danish move in. Atlas will be eliminated. The final player alive is going to fall, but the heavens aren't so welcoming this time. Danish best position. Best result. They'll be the champions of match number one. It was as sweet as a Danish pastry. They were able to get the victory. And honestly, once they found that position in the Northwest, it was hard for anyone to really push up on them. They dominated that area for quite some time. But not did they just hold, but they were also pushing on their advantages. When they noticed there was teams in the Trials Tunnel, for example, they were joining that fight. They were poking. They were prodding. They were picking up extra damage. They were picking up extra kills when they could. And they are starting off where they left off from yesterday. They are looking like one of the favorite teams. Yeah, looking very, very solid. And we questioned, you know, are they going to have the Evo to hold the position? Well, I think it was just such a strong position that anyone who tried to push, they were always getting opening damage onto them, right? And then we saw the kind of, I'm going to use the word, raucous inside of the tunnel around trials. And so many teams went in and out of there that they didn't really have to do too much because as soon as one team tried to progress on them, that fight would take place. And they'd be like, cool, all right, cool. We'll clean up this damage. We'll try and hold this position for as long as we can. But that's that's trials, right? It's it's such a tough zone to get into if you're not there early due to the you know, the huge dynamic of the height difference between some of the areas that you can hold. And you have to remember, Danish started today with 10 points as well from their performance yesterday in winner's bracket round two. So not only did they have the lead coming into it, but they have just extended that lead, getting them extremely close to match point already after match number one. So this is a little bit scary for those who are involved in the lobby, but of course we are guaranteed to play at least six matches, even if we were to see a team win very early. doesn't happen too often in Amir and NA. I mean, I don't remember a time that we've finished before six, certainly when we've been commentating, Mark, but exciting times for Danish because they have dominated in game number one. I was going to say, whenever we're commentating this match point, it's usually at least eight, nine. At least Maybe even double figures, everybody. Who knows? But yeah, that's the kind of start that you want, right? And I think you mentioned Danish at the top of the show saying that they were a team who have put up consistent... Well, one of the teams who's put up the most wins yes. so far. And we're seeing exactly why, right? It's winning games in PLQs can be tough because, like we mentioned previously, some of the unpredictable factors that come into it. But I think then the one thing that was impressive about that was the commanding of space, how they didn't allow people to move on to their spot, even though it was a great zone for them. Um and then being able to convert in the final moments as well is always important. And I think that they only got up to purples right in the end game as well, which shows that, you know, they knew how to play that zone. They knew what weapons were going to be best for it, for that spot, if they were able to claim it. And having priority zone and being able to win them is a huge thing because even to this point, you know, there's a lot of teams who can't manage to win the zones which come close to them. And I think just for a confidence boost, it's the perfect start for them. Mm-hmm. There were a few teams that I saw exit maybe earlier than I expected. We saw DN go out first. They came sixth in winner's bracket round two in the PLQ. So I was almost expecting them to be a bit more of a threat in the lobby. So the fact they went down early, they're going to have to make up for that going into the second match today. 
I look at elsewhere. You want to mention Red Dragon at the top of the uh, the show as well. They had a good amount of kills. Not sure about the placement points. They managed to sort of force their way into the top 10 at least. So there will be a couple uh, for sure. But that's the what I think their game plan is going to be, right? You mentioned that when we've seen a couple of those types of players on the likes of Aurora lineups, then they like to play edge. They like to play it slow. They like to path their way to Evo and then try and fight their way in for points in the end game. The question for me is always like, they'll probably get to match point, you would imagine the amount of kills and decent placements they can get but it's winning the game right you've got to win a game here to win match point unless you want to kind of roll the dice a little bit and say hey will we have enough point at the end of the day to, to qualify back into pro league yeah it's going to be very circle dependent as it always is in apex legends but red dragon playing in that way there are going to be certain zones that really benefit them there's going to be zones that don't benefit them i mean they had to kind of traversed the map quite a lot in that one they weren't able to hunker down but i imagine once they get to match point we might see the play style change a little bit so that's a discussion we'll have as the games go on for sure but it's whether you get that opportunity are you going to get to match point quick enough where you can actually play in that way because you know danish if they get another victory here with another like a decent amount of kills they could already be on match point now naturally when this happens when we see a team that already started on 10 get a victory we go into match two and they struggle a little bit and they maybe get a little bit too excited the adrenaline's right rushing through them and they're not able to perform but we'll have to see i mean there's something about the way danish have been playing over these past couple of days that they really feel like they deserve to be back in pro league and they want to make a statement We'll have to see if uh, game number two will be their game in just a few moments. We're going to go for a quick break. Game number one is done and dusted. Danish, of course, taking home the win and looking like the team to beat today after just one game. We'll have to see how they get on in game number two. Welcome back, everyone. Danish with an explosive game one. I'm Vicky Kitty. I'm joined with Dan. And you were able to take us through a lot of the action there, Dan. But Danish ended up doing it again. They were popping off yesterday. And now they're maybe halfway towards match point here after just one game alone. Yeah, sometimes when we get these tournaments where it's across a few days, we might see teams that are performing well on day one or two, but then they hit a slump once you get to the finals. But it seems like whatever they had for breakfast yesterday, they had it again today because Danish are in fine form and now they find themselves over halfway to match point from what I could tell from the totals that I was looking at from their kills and from the final placement. So they are going to be the biggest threat in this lobby. Yes, it was one of the perfect zone pools for them. So you have to win those games. In a lobby like this, you need to be making sure you take advantage of circles that pull towards your POI. Whether they'll have that opportunity or not again, that's the real question. Especially the lonely lot north of Trials. It is a bloodbath when it comes to rotating late game towards that exact end zone spot. We saw what happened to the teams that were forced to rotate from the south side of Trials. But we still have one more game here on World's Edge before we make that transition into Storm Point here. This is match point format. So now we get to see how Danish is going to be able to carry that momentum going into the second game. Yeah, they will now be so confident they will be pushing teams they'll be more than happy to take fights because of how they've played in the previous but they won that game by avoiding fights to begin with they made sure they rotated quickly they had ring console information and they moved as fast as they could 
it's going to be another situation like that for, for me. If they get a circle that pulls even remotely close to their POI, they are a team that will move very quickly. They know the zones very good as well, so I'm expecting them to do more of the same. However, if it's going to be a southeast zone, for example, we're going to have to see what they can do in a different scenario where do they still move quickly with poor armors or do they start to play things a little bit slower? Maybe play towards trending of an edge play style, maybe go for a little bit more beacons so they can try and level up those Evo shields. A lot of questions to be answered, but I guess we can only find them out when we see that circle and when we get into this game. Let's get started already. Game number two here on World Edge. Where are we going to be traveling to? Is it going to be to the north side, south side? I always like to play these guessing games with these final circles here. You see me all the time in our talent chat. Danish already going to be able to get looted up here, splitting up some of that loot that we were talking about earlier while we take a look at them also being able to split that with big Ahmad or rather Mirage Atwam. But here with Danish already having the lead with 29 points, a lot of these teams now having to buckle down because with Danish having so much success and being as consistent as they have been, even playing the eight games in the last two days, I mean, probably qualifiers are always so crazy. It also tests out to see how much Apex you could actually play at the highest level without getting burnt out, which is just a whole nother topic when it comes to the professional mental game that you have to go into these games. And I'm just looking at the circle. This might just be a day for the Danes because it is heading right to Mirage Atwa. It is going to be a perfect circle for them yet wow. again. And not only, it's not like they are at either Lava Fisher or Mirage Atwa. They are able to split those POIs. They are able to have both here. And they're going to be kind of looted, booted, ready to go and prepared for other teams to join them. They do have a survey beacon at Mirage Atwa and they have a ring console information at Lava Fisher. So they have spread themselves so impressively here that they're going to be able to hit both, get any information that they would like and then be prepared to fight anyone who arrives. You've got Urgency down at Thermal Station. They're going to be in another position where they can move up and pot potentially take the chokehold just south of Mirage Atwa and then SPS from staging. They don't have any ring console information by the looks of it. So sadly for then they're not going to really know where this circle is going per se and deadfish is right close to them too on their rotate something that sps is going to have to look out for so that way they can prevent themselves from getting pinched as we take a look at other teams kneecap rotating through kaiser i love some of these names that we have in our lobby but they do have a ring console so that's information that they're going to be rotating with as well as other squads here making their move Shiv's team is going to be able to rotate already from Monument, rolling teams, getting some information if they can before rotating probably through Landside. And Landside's already congested here, as you can see, too. Going to be able to get the Replicator some extra loot while they make their rotate. But a lot of teams already on the quick rotate, trying to get to where Mirage Atwa is. Danish has already moved away from Lava Fisher. They got that ring console that you mentioned earlier, Dan. And now mm -hmm. we're going to be playing on that south side of Mirage Atwa by that choke point. I will say, I'm glad that we don't have body part call outs like in other video games there's things like elbow for example or left <laughs> arm I, I struggle a little bit with kneecap being involved in this game kneecap pushing through the elbow maybe trying to get to the head of it it's just a you know it's a tough situation for a caster uh, but kneecap as you mentioned are going to be progressing on that eastern side and they're going to be there for quite a while because it is a long old way to go for those who are over towards overlook geyser big Maud, all these teams that can have to not only move from east to west but also try and break through a lot of the central areas which are going to be held down by some of the teams who are going to be rotating a little bit quicker uh, potentially our first fight could be happening here the warlords will land but the warlords land safely and it doesn't look like it's necessarily going to be a skirmish at the moment because they are just gonna get those barrels down and keep on moving and grooving and even with some of the changes that we saw in the last patch notes, we consistently still see the Bangalore Caustic and Bloodhound being played on World's Edge. And it's just because of how strong that smoke is, especially against teams that are running full roller players out here. It's just something to note before we make that transition into Storm Point. Atlas being another one of those teams, making their rotate. From the other side of Lava Siphon, you can see the pings going down. And you talked about it earlier, actually, with Mark in the first game. But these rotates really having an influence with the pathing on where these evil harvesters are. It looks like they're about to engage in a fight right now with Atlas coming in from right behind. They got the gold energy mag on that Nemesis, too. Philzone now having to back away in time while Robin's trying to give him some suppressed fire. 
Yeah, sometimes you can be a little bit naughty. You can hang around those harvesters. You can bait in them a little bit and maybe get a little surprise attack on teams that might be going for them later. But teams have become more aware of that as they've got used to playing in a game where the Evo harvesters exist, for sure. You just have to keep your eyes peeled and make sure no one is going to be trying to ambush you. But there's a lot of teams at the moment who have kind of moved in from this kind of south side that have forced their way into the staging area and surrounding. And there is so many squads now that... Is. If you move, if you even breathe too heavily, people are going to know where you are. So you have to be Absolutely. careful. Yes, you can kind of get a little bit of damage here or there by getting some pop shots. But if you show too much, if people realize you're on just a blue or a white, you might get pushed. Or if you're a duo looking at Meow right now and they lost out on their Caustic, which is supposed to give them the space in this building, which means with a Bloodhound scan, it's going to be easy for any team trying to find their own real estate to just push onto this team since there's no Caustic barrels that they have to worry about. Essentially gassing them out too with a Caustic Nox gas. Go. And that's exactly what we're going to see right now from one of our teams. They're already trying to force the push right here. They use the smoke so that way they don't pre they prevent themselves from getting third party from other teams within the area. But nice Thermite placement and Arc are to try to put in some more fire for Forbidden. Wow, this is messy from Forbidden. They wanted to make that push. They wanted to get engaging here, but there was kind of damage done from other teams getting involved with the, those grenades that you were talking about, and they're really not able to push up here. I wonder whether they're just going to go for a retreat, and it looks like they might do so, but this push has really left them in a tough spot. They've locked him out. Let the man in. Okay, there we go. They are going to be okay, and they can reset here, but that was a bit of a struggle bus. This is the Caustic house now, all right? Calamitous seeing another day. Literally one shot right now. Pops that Phoenix. You have to imagine the other squads in the area. Danish, I believe, does have the high ground over these two houses. And they actually save Meow's life. You could see the duo still playing on that second floor. That push just unfortunately shut down almost immediately. But that's going to be the coexisting that we're going to see from more of these teams, since they are running the Caustic, that they're going to be able to share more of these buildings. And with the nice overhead, look how many squads have already found themselves on the Mirage Twa side of the circle. Yeah, and there's a few areas where it could be finishing here. You can see it just kind of northeast of Mirage Twa as a finishing zone that we might see teams play for, and potentially even on the eastern side of the train track. So it's what you bank on here if you have that information. But remember, a lot of these squads won't have this information that we actually see because hitting a ring console at this point, if you are one of the teams that is already there, is unlikely. What is more likely is the teams who are playing edge and are rotating in late, they might be able to get that ring console information. And then potentially, if you get survey beacon as well, then you can maybe rotate in and try and find a spot that hasn't been taken because of the information you've been able to gather. So there's always that element of it when you are making your way through the map, but it is congested at the moment. And as soon as damage does start to happen in one of the areas, it might encourage a few people who aren't in the zone right now to come out of their hidey holes a little bit. And we might see a lot of teams at once engaging. And even if squads want to try to try to fight their way to get that survey beacon to the south side of Mirage Trois, Danish is completely covering that side too. So looking at the choke that you currently see Deadfish fighting SPS, actually sandwiching them in this slot right here. Look, the Watson fences to the north side. Picasso's painting over there. And it looks like it was also a fight for a care package. So right now with both of these teams sharing this slot, urgency on the other side of SPS. And then Deadfish, who is gatekeeping them, they have information on where that next circle was pulling like urgency right now where they know that they're gonna have to move north eventually but do they contest spf and deadfish or do they wrap around from the back side of staging yeah, it's, I think it's going to have to be one of these teams who are not in the circle at the moment to kind of disrupt the flow of the game at the moment. You can see Taskmaster just got a knock as well in the kill feed. So Red Dragon, uh, they are getting involved. But there's teams like Atlas, players, rolling teams, NPC. They haven't found a home yet. And as soon as they do try and find a home, then they might have to force someone else out of there. So that's why the lobby at the moment is still a little bit slower, still a little bit indecisive. Uh, but potentially Urgency might actually follow their name here and try and use some of this urgency to take down the team ahead of them. Although the duo called Meow eventually falls through. That's going to be the first team that we're going to say goodbye to in game number two for now. But a lot of other stragglers too. A lot of unfinished teams. I know that for you, Sosa is going to be a duo currently right now, as well as SPS on the north side of exactly where we're seeing right here. You can see them still playing on that south side building while Urgency takes onto the roof. Trying to find an angle with this massive. Has been trying his hardest, but I have to commend them as that circle two is closing in at the moment. They'll be able to see where that next circle is going to be pulling with more squads rotating from behind them. Yeah, this isn't going to be fun for urgency. I'm trying to work out whether 
I would prefer them to kind of move east and try and go through that choke because it could be a little bit more comfortable from what I can see, but they don't know that. And naturally, you do try and push west here as players also, they're struggling on their rotate in at the moment. They're getting griefed from every single angle, it would seem, trying to get bats off, using the smoke as their best advantage and actually doing damage through the smoke as well. Uh, but it looks like players just able to reset, but they are very much in no man's land right now. That's the beauty of the Beast of the Hunt out here, but losing out on your Bangalore is not the way to go as they try to find themselves in a crevice. Rolling teams, one of the teams that we had highlighted earlier in our pre-show now, looking to clean up some heads before they back away in time, calling it just in case a third party was uh, actually positioning themselves behind them. They see the opportunity, they move back and kneecap instead has moved forward. Great timing on that squad to just back away back towards Landslide. Rolling teams will be inevitably meeting up with MPC while kneecap Clean up that north side. It's a good job from kneecap. And a lot of damage that is being done. You can see Funk able to get a knock. And it looks like they are going to push up on this and just secure that knock into a kill. You can see the gas is very much flowing throughout the game. It's OR9 have lost one. And it looks like they are going to be retreating as well. Just trying to survive as a two naturally. But there are other teams getting involved. And you can see over at Landslide as well. Rolling team struggling at the moment. Adam has already fallen, and it looks like Bazaar might be there as well, but just about scrolls, uh, slides away, and now Rolling Team's in a good spot. And don't have big beds either. It doesn't look like it, at least. I see the shield cells coming in. They lose out on one, and now playing it out as a duo. Here comes the third party. Players are hungry. They don't stop at one third party. They have to move on to the next here versus rolling teams. They're wrapping up behind them, but let's not forget who's behind players. It is Kneecap that had cleaned up the stragglers of that previous fight from OR9, who have backed away in time. Now players trying to get into a different position with that Havoc just tearing through the French squad, going down, losing out on Robin and Taylor here. Trying to find a nice cover behind the other side of the fence line, but players have been on a roll so far. They see the NPC have been eliminated too by the tunnel side of Landslide, and Kami Data is going to get involved for a fourth party. Players were one of the teams that were able to get a victory yesterday in winner's bracket round two, so they're always going to be one of the teams I'm looking at to potentially win today. Any team that found victories yesterday becomes a possible favorite going into match point for sure, because winning is everything once you get there. But players are just trying to survive right now. It doesn't matter which corner you turn, though. There is another team looking at you, and it looks like it could be bad news bears for players. Just as I say, they could be one of the favorites. It looks like maybe it's a commentator curse coming through. Oh, nice little surprise attack, though. Is able to catch the remainder of rolling teams and there is still life just yet for players but it's slowly fading 17 squads left as rolling teams exit out of this lobby kami data involved in all the chaos on the north side right here where there was three to four squads that they were dealing with now moving forward red dragons looking at this too from the north side of the train tracks and they are not getting involved but they are absolutely gatekeeping this team with little no cover you only really have the smoke grenades from the teams they're going to be forcing their way into that next circle from landslide and it is going to be a severe shift of circle as well. I'll touch on that when we get the map feed, but for now, we're just watching Kumi Dada and whether they can survive. Gold Res is going to be there, so they should be able to get back up to a full three. Young Hong Kong also in the kill feed, getting a knock. 16 squads still remain, and not much circle to play with, but you can see there on the map overhead, it is going to be shifting very much east of the train tracks, which I said could have been a potential final circle. That is bad news for the likes of DN and Window Cleaners, who are still at Mirage Atoir. Danish have moved off of Mirage Atoir, but still have to move from west to east. So all of those teams that are on that Mirage side are going to have to heavily move towards the eastern side here. It's going to be uncomfortable. That's going to be a bloodbath too, because once a lot of these teams now move over from that west to east side, where are you going to get that cover when there's already three teams that have taken control over the train tracks aside from Red Dragons? You have Atlas, you have Trojan that are waiting for them inside of those carts. Danish involved in the fight. They've been frying it out here. Young Hong Kong holding the door before following up with Fricks, who's incredibly low. Young Hong Kong loses out. And Sherb now moving in to try to get the follow-up. Deadfish get eliminated, and Red Dragon are still claiming heads. This is what we were talking about, though. Danish having to play a little bit differently now because they have to move away from where they were holding. In game one, the game came to them. Now they have to bring themselves to the game and find themselves in a different spot. But Red Dragon, they are holding the high ground over a couple of teams and just shredding from above. It's never fun when you are in, on this angle as the team below. You just have to kind of hope that you can force a drop down to at least survive for a little bit longer. But as the two remaining here, I think they know their time might be up, especially with other squads arriving as well. And Red Dragon want that so bad, but it's not like 
like they have a horizon where they can just bounce right back up to high ground. They're not giving up this spot, not one bit. Holding on to not only the high ground, but gatekeeping these other teams. The Kraber shot getting the next knock here. Gatekeeping the squad who is running from the circle. Receives is going to be able to back away just in time. Nice follow-up coming in from the rest of Red Dragons with 14 squads still left, and they are still claiming more. They're literally focused on two teams at the same time. One below them and the other squad coming out of circle. Two teams that are in very bad positions from where the circle is pulling towards. And just look at that screen as well. The, the red and the purple of Red Dragon, and then it's a blue swarm of all the other teams that are around them. It's really been well played by Red Dragon to ensure those Eva shields get leveled up. Is now forbidden. They're going to be moving as one of those teams from west to east, but they're also holding out some of the teams that were behind them. Call me Dada. Eliminated. Ten squads now remaining, but it's going to be less. Shimani also go down. So nine squads here as forbidden still have held strong, and they're in a decent spot as well. If they force their way through on this southern side, if they count the team above, uh, above them, which is Trojan, I believe, they will be in a nice spot to just slot themselves into the southern zone. And in all this ruckus, as you guys love to say here, moving away from that circle, Danish have also been eliminated in this lobby. Forbidden coming out on top, exiting out from that west side, as well as Free Sosa coming in from that low ground. Before they rotate into that next circle, though, they're going to be gate kept by Atlas, a team that does have the rampart. I believe they have some rampart walls to work with. We're going to have to see as Trojan on the high ground. Going to be able to take some shots using the banners and some extra cover here. They get two knocked off of that. Now finally dropping down to see if they can get some extra loot that they needed to work with. I think the rest of the lobby would have been happy to see Danish eliminated as well. They're not going to be finding themselves onto match point as they're not able to go back to back here. Uh, sadly, it was a very heavy shift of circle for them that they just couldn't really push through all the teams that were in the way on that progress from west to east now eight teams remain circle is going to close here for round three trojan forbidden atlas or nine red dragon they all have to kind of move in it's the apex warlords that are in one of the best spots at the moment in the far southeast of the map so we will definitely be keeping an eye on them and i'm expecting them to get into the top three Absolutely, especially since they're not going to have anybody contesting them from behind. It's really just urgency playing right underneath them, and it's just a solo at that. Red Dragon still with the chaos, the onslaught of damage, being able to nail down everybody with that hemlock, popping the beast of the hunt right now, too. They're clearing these train tracks while also keeping an eye on the team that's far to their right. Just look at these shields as well. It's so powerful for Red Dragon to be pushing in with a red armor swarm right now. And every team that goes up against them, I think, is going to be turning with their tails between their legs when you see those reds. It's just so difficult to try and go up against it. The extra damage that you can take here for Red Dragon. Now they're going to be pushing through the smoke as well. If they can command this bridge, definitely put themselves in one of the better positions to try and win this entire game. And you can see Trojan, the last remaining player, just literally hiding with a tail between the legs to survive and maybe get some extra placement points. But now Red Dragon, they have the high ground. They have the ability to kind of rain down hell on all the teams that are below them here. And they have information too. Off of that Bloodhound scan, they know that there's a duo playing right underneath this bridge. There's a trio right in front of them. They're taking up so much space. The bang ult has been called in. They're going to be able to back away. Look at Taskmaster, who did even take a lick of damage here too. And you can see the duo right underneath them still right here. But they are going to be forced to drop down eventually, where they'll also be not only in the line of sight of the duo underneath them, the trio that's right there, DN, as well as Apex Warlords, like you mentioned, that it's inside of that building. Yeah, a couple of uh, rats to try and disrupt things as well. OR9 have a rat, Urgency have a rat, and they can make a difference here. And the aim of the game for them is, of course, try and get into top five, try and get those placement points. As Red Dragon have lost one, they jump down, but it doesn't matter because Red Dragon are able to steamroll through the other team. They still should be able to get back up to a 4-3 here unless they get pushed, but it looks like they're okay. They take down Atlas. They felt like Atlas were a real threat below them on that bridge, and they ensured that they got aggressive. They took that spot off them before the circle started coming in. And now Red Dragon can somewhat reset, but the circle is going to force them out here. Hey, that gold knockdown, though, definitely came in clutch as Apex Warlords, a team that was waiting so patiently in that building, are forced to play this final oh, circle no. with only blue evos. And that is the problem that you're at risk with. When Red Dragon has just been completely clearing out that north side of the circle, they're going to contest this fight with three red evos versus three blue evos. Yeah, this was bad news for Apex Warlords and all the teams to push them. If it was Red Dragon, it was always going to be a difficult spot because the red versus blue is just superior in this instance. And now Red Dragon looking to try and clean sweep here and try and get a victory. Not only were they able to push their, push their biggest threats, but now they're going to have the high ground against every other team. And of course, we have solos there as well. Zerifa still alive for the Apex Warlords trying to get some placement points. 
The fact that Red Dragon's looking like they're just farming this lobby right now. Five squads left, and look at that. They have 9 KP already. They get another one. It was a solo from Forbidden. Finally going out, but going out in fifth place. As Red Dragon look over the high ground, look at the squad that's right directly across from them. You talk about the scattered rats. Well, now look who's right there. Xerifer is still alive from now, and the squad right underneath them is just still trying to fight for placement. Red Dragon eventually Ooh. dropped down, but a bit of miscommunication maybe only leaving Taskmaster alive. Oh no, and he misses the initial shot as well. Maybe he can get us what? Maybe he can just use these shields to his advantage here. It is going to be a tough spot to be in. Tries to go for the shred and gets the shred. And Red Dragon, they get the sweep, they get the game, and they show us why they're one of the favorites here today. It was a 1v1 between Apex Warlords and Red Dragon, but man, they always end up doing it. Taskmaster is a legend for a reason, but they cleaned up that lobby, Dan. Unbelievable game from Red Dragon. The management to get to the kind of superior shield situation they found themselves in in the mid game and then utilizing those shields to push aggressively at the right time. The team below them, Atlas on the bridge, they had to eliminate them first and then they saw the Apex Warlords in the distance. Now, you don't really want to push the Apex Warlords in most instances, but because they were on blue, as soon as they did that damage, they said, all right, let's get involved. Let's make sure we take the high ground. It almost went from bad to worse when they dropped into the Watson fences. But, you know, if you've got shots like that in a 1v1 then you're always going to be taking the dub when they're scattered 1v1v1 at that point and there was a bit of miscommunication and at the very end you drop down hey as long as you clutch it out you take not only the dub but what did they finish like 19 kills at the end they were going absolutely crazy on that final circle and it's what you mentioned before when you see that the team that is holding probably the god spot for that final circle has only blue evos that's when you essentially push because you have the health advantage on your side in that moment and that's the risk that you put your team in when you only try to fight for that final circle positioning without being able to have access to these evil harvesters or even putting down damage with long range weapons. What a response it's going to be from Red Dragon points wise as well. After what we saw from Danish and they had a 19 point game in match number one, we're looking at a 20 plus point game here for Red Dragon. And as a challenger circuit team that have come through and maybe there's the expectation after their performance so far this weekend, they are living up to said expectation. And the entire squad is looking like they are thriving in this meta, thriving on these maps. But when we do change over to Storm Point, is that going to be a different situation? Because that's always the fun thing with Match Point here, Vicky. We do see teams that are better at world's edge perform well to begin with but then is it going to start to fall away when we move to storm point we're gonna have to see i mean i do know for winners round two red dragon was top three in that moment so that consistency did carry over from map to map but will it matter where it matters the most here in the finals lobby and it's exciting to see how that game also impacted their total score because they probably came into this with some extra points i believe so now adding that all up together as well as danish that's gonna be two squads that more of these teams definitely have to keep their eye on yeah, they came in joint third with Trojan, so they will have at least uh, eight points, if I'm correct, if not seven, depending on the, the tiebreaker there. So they are going to be catching up Danish. They could even be ahead of Danish, depending on how many kills they got in that final moment as well, when we get the scores that are uh, totaled up at the end. But we've got our two front runners for sure. It's Danish and Red Dragon. Naturally, that's going to happen after two games when you see teams get victories. But can those victories still come through a little bit later on as we get through the day, as people get a little bit more tired as you get through the game? So Red Dragon and Danish is who we're looking at, but then you have to be looking at the other squads who perform well yesterday that can maybe make an impact in match number three and four. Call Me Dada, Trojan, Rolling Teams, DN, Forbidden, they all performed uh, excellently yesterday, and we know they could maybe be a real threat in this lobby today as well. And it goes back to what we're talking about with mindset, making sure that you could traverse through all these multiple games without feeling that burnout, that Apex Legends, when you play for grueling hours, especially in lobbies like this, it could really weigh down on your shoulders. So making sure that you keep yourself fresh, no matter the different compositions that you have to run, going from World's Edge to Storm Point, definitely stays on point there. But with an explosive game like that for game number two and Red Dragons playing so confidently, I'm expecting it to carry over to Storm Point, Dan. Yes, we have our two front runners after match one and two, but is it going to be a three horse race? Will we find a third squad that potentially joins these front runners? Maybe we'll find out after this break. Match number three coming up.
welcome back to the PLQ here in EMEA. We are two matches in already. I don't even know how that happened here on set, but it's time for us to switch focus to Stormpoint. Now match number three. Let's see what these teams can bring to the table. Yeah, it's one thing I love about when we get match point format is that as soon as people start to feel comfortable <laughs> on the map, we change the map, which just makes it fun, right? Every two maps, it's like, okay, we're going to change things up. And it's almost as if you can jump into the comms sometimes. You know what those conversations are going to be. It's like, okay, guys, next game, you know, let's try and play this spot. And then someone goes, by the way, we're, we're on storm point now. And they're like, okay, cool. All right, all right, so storm point then. And the conversation starts again. It just it keeps these players on their toes all of the time. And of course, it's our first look at storm point today in the, uh, in the PLQ. But the two teams who we kind of said might be the front runners are the front runners after game one and game two. Red Dragon and Danish taking those games home uh, as the winners and some decent KP alongside it as well. So both well on their way towards match point here. Okay, listen, I, I need to, I, we, we need to clarify this too here on set. You're talking about decent KP on the rated match point. Red Dragon on 53 points. They've hit it in two okay. matches. Okay? okay, they were at 19 kills in that second game with obviously closing out the entire match. That put them over that threshold. We talked about this during the format. This is wild to me because we had mentioned we'd never seen it done before six in a PLQ before. Well, Red Dragon now on 53 points. If they somehow continue this steamrolling, they could secure their spot in three matches. That I don't even, I can't, I can't, I can't imagine that. That is what you call a uh, good economy of games. <laughs> so you turn up, finals, three games, you're chilling, you're done. And then it's just about having a little bit of fun in the remaining games. Uh, an amazing performance so far from Red Dragon and no surprise as well here on Storm Point. See them having one of the priority POIs as to be honest with you, you don't really want to be fighting them. They're going to be landing right at the northern tip of the map here uh, over towards Lightning Rod, etc. And, uh, you know, they're going to have so much loot to play with as well. And I think that's the scariest thing. They're going to have the ability to have a ring console by the looks of things as well. They've also got that Trident. They've got Evo right next to them. It's such a strong POI. There's a reason that TSM take it in North America. And when you're already on match point, and you've got the ability to leave with guaranteed blues, maybe even purples with a, a little stop along the way. Hmm. It's, it puts you in a great spot, essentially. And I think Red Dragon going to be very happy when they hit that ring console and see that they don't have a huge amount of distance to cover as well. You know, and we talked about this being a possibility, but the reason... I want to see how this all plays out for Red Dragon as we get a look at the top down here, see where the zone's going to shift and how they could potentially now be making their rotation to where they want to be. They're in such a good spot, and you were talking about all of the utility and resources available to them. Will the other teams have been paying attention enough to know that Red Dragon is now on match point? Is that even a concern, knowing that we will bare minimum be going to six matches so that these other teams have an opportunity to compete so that won't even be a concern? Will people just let Red Dragon potentially take this home? Like, what are the choices here? I think it's the fact that we're definitely playing a certain amount of games today is different to what it used to be in match point, right? right? Because people would be focusing on Red Dragon and being like, okay, we need to keep this going. If we're outside of those qualification spots right now, we need to make sure that this tournament does not end here and now. But I think you just have to play the game as it is for now. Red Dragon have put themselves in a great position. Fantastic. And if they win right now, great. But there's still more games to play. And you don't want to be in a position where you're throwing your game away to stop Red Dragon winning thinking the tournament's going to end when it's not going to end. It's going to keep going and an opportunity for points is going to elude you. So I think that's probably the smartest way to approach things. However, you never know. <laughs> you genuinely never know what PLQs. Another team that's doing well, Danish and uh, Trojan actually just went past them on their rotation away from down beast. Danish making their way on over to mill, but Trojan trying to see if they can find a little bit uh, more loot here for themselves, get those evos up before they push all the way in into the next zone. They're in a really good spot, at least loot and information wise here, hitting that checkpoint before they kind of move back north and get themselves a little bit safer. Uh, but right now, everybody definitely starting to set themselves up safely. We talked about how we could potentially see a lot more early game chaos in something like a PLQ, but right now we're just seeing some classic conservative Apex Legends gameplay. Yeah, I think the early game's been pretty quiet. It's been the mid game, which has been a bit strange with a lot of teams looking to play the edge of zone and essentially the zone contributing to a lot of deaths for teams. Well, nobody wants to try and rotate ahead of someone. Everybody's not letting each other rotate and just kind of holding each other out. It's just getting a little bit messy in and around that end game. And 
the mid game, excuse me. And speaking of Messi, they fish at the moment. They've lost one. And this is pretty much where the game is going to be ending. We are going to be heading outside of kind of the drop down of the wall towards where those egg building or nut building, whatever you want to call it, are going to be. So this is a really rough zone to try and get into from the southern side. The only difference I would say between the new season since season 20, this zone compared to what it used to be, is at least now, if you're approaching late, you have the ability to path with a trident, whatever it might be, mm. to hit so many evo caches to make sure you're approaching to give yourself a fighting chance. If you evac in late, you fight your way in late, you're going to have purples, you're going to have reds. It's a chance at least to get into this zone. Yeah, we're seeing a little bit of poke damage coming out as teams are starting to rotate in and try to at least claim some space. We saw SPS being a little annoying when Deadfish had to move in a couple more squads holding on to that northwestern side. All of these nut buildings already getting locked down nice and early as teams are going to try and fight for a little bit of space here. Trojan, that squad we saw rotating, have at least one player now on purple, so they were able to get a little bit more before they made their push in as well. And this is just going to be one of those areas that everyone knows about, tries to get too early, and if they can't, they know they're going to have to fight their way through. There's not a lot of real estate here where this could potentially pull for that final circle. So right now we see rolling teams trying to claim one of these rocks and hopefully have some decent sight lines on the teams around them. But at least having the caustic will dissuade anyone from making some crazy early pushes. This is a, a good... I would say opportunity to talk about some of the unpredictability of a lobby like this, right? Because everybody isn't sure of the timing of other teams' rotations in and around the area. We do see our first team being eliminated, by the way, in the meantime, which is going to be DN. And I think that's why you're seeing a lot of teams arriving kind of in a similar time and going, hey, wait, there's nowhere for us to play. Now we're kind of stuck between our plan A isn't going to be here. What's our plan B? How do we try and get out of this situation? And that's what you're seeing here right in the edge of zone, right? You can see one player has been knocked and that's because the, the nut buildings were already taken. The timing on their rotate was off and they found themselves with an all in, all or nothing play that they now can't make. So they've got to react on the fly. I do really quickly, by the way, just want to talk about Red Dragon because they have so many evo opportunities on their path towards this zone. We mentioned Lightning Rod right where they dropped. They had an evo cache. They also had a ring console. Now they've headed over towards Zeus Station where there's another one for them. There's also another ring console for them to hit as well. If they keep going towards zone as well, they might be able to hit some Prowlers. There's another Evo. So there's a real opportunity for them to maybe approach this zone with late purples, maybe even some reds if they play it right. Which would be really intimidating with Red Dragon coming in on the edge completely free, uncontested. No one's really rotated into their path either, but we talked about Danish earlier. A team that's been doing well today so far. Potentially another squad that could get on match point after this match. Finding themselves a little bit on the back foot. I believe they took out window cleaners, if I'm not mistaken. To get to this point, we're able to get one more backup, so now it's two. Still trying to get that third, but there are so many teams that are looking in their direction and making that really difficult, so the reset is not coming easy easily to Danish right now. They're in a decent spot, but with the amount of vision that people could have, it might be a little bit detrimental. Meanwhile, NPC finding themselves in a back and forth as well. Shields down on one, and they're just going to try and stay alive, use the smoke to their advantage. Everyone is feeling a little restless, knowing that there's not a lot of space they have to move into. Yeah, it's a pretty clean fight for them by the looks of things. Nobody's gone down. They've managed to pick up two knocks already, and I think it's just one more player who is trying to escape at the moment. You can already see they're trying to chase and down with the beast of the hump but might be able to get hit the cannon might be able to get out of there and survive for now or at least put himself in a position to hit the battery and maybe think about ratting out this position although always a little bit scary with this many bloodhounds in the lobby just one scan and your game is going to be over but this is happening right down on the southern side of the zone at the moment this is a battle outside of the tunnel to kind of cut through to where we find ourselves right now but Elsewhere, this is very interesting. Red Dragon are inside of wall at the moment. Players are also inside of wall too. So they're kind of poking up against each other. But elsewhere, you can see that Young Hong Kong, Sherbert, and Freaks have managed to get back up to a full three here. So they're going to be in a position to hit now Danish to maybe walk up onto rolling teams. Definitely a really clutch moment here. So let's jump on in with Danish's comms and see what they got to say about handling the situation. Hey, you want to go? Yeah, you have it? You have it? Let's walk up, walk up close first. Walk up trench. Don't see anyone. I'm gonna scan. Scan, 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 scan. All left, Nothing. all left. Spike left. Wait on me, bro. Okay, bro. Watch right there. Fine. Bang one, bang one. It's with Logan. Here, Cossack. Nice. One, one, last one, last one. 
Yeah, I'm on top, I'm on top. Oh, I got shot from the... Bro, I'm just dying every time. Like, they just triple screen. That was a rough fight here on behalf of Danish. They were trying to hold that down. We're able to get some scan and information, but not able to handle the 3v3. Rolling teams take them out, and I think that might have stopped their chances of getting on match point for Danish as well. Yeah, it was a little bit of a rough fight for them. You saw the the damage was good initially, but it was just a 3v2 in the middle, and they weren't be able to get that first knock to make the numbers even, and from there, they kind of got run over a little bit in the in that final moment. Rolling Teams is a team who did survive. By the way, I have no idea how, but I just saw in the background there, Red Dragon have managed to move into one of those nut buildings, uncontested. We saw how busy <laughs> it was a few moments ago in and around those nut buildings, and I don't know who left, if someone got knocked and had to leave to think about a revive, but whatever happened, Red Dragon have got purple shields and they're inside one of those buildings. So there's a real chance here that they could be involved in our end game. I think it will definitely boil down to what happens on that southern side of the ring, which teams start pushing through those chokes and what positions they're able to really nail down and how well Red Dragon can focus on the rest of the teams also hanging out in the nut buildings and at least keep them away for now. Hopefully, in their eyes, everyone else in the lobby taking each other out, giving less for Red Dragon to have to focus on. Meanwhile... We've got nice Evos here at Shimani as they're moving towards the rest of the team. They're playing right on the outskirts of this next circle, trying to wait and see if they can maybe gatekeep anybody, at least get the, any more Evo caches that they might have not hit before they make their final push in because there's actually a decent amount of teams that are still stuck on blues right now. Speaking of which, Deadfish, who of course did have one player knocked a little bit earlier, managed to get back up to a full three and they do have the blues. They have a really good spot as well. And they're going to be holding out players at the moment who are trying to move through that choke. They also have another choke, which, of course, they've got to keep their eyes on. There's OR9 are going to be moving through there. But the blue armors is very tough to work around. But the fact that they're holding a spot down with the Watson gen means at least they can play close to that gen. And you kind of get an extra little bit of HP because if someone has to close the gap on you when they've done initial damage, that's going to naturally charge it up for you. So you almost get back into the fight a little bit quicker. So holding down that spot with the Watson gen could be so important. As we see, the Warlords going at it right now against NPC. And that's outside of the zone as well, so they're going to need to clean this up. Meow going down in the kill feed while NPC try to see if they can make something happen with this beast of the hunt, trying to give them the information that they're looking for as they make their push inside, looking for some damage. A shield crack does come through. NPC taking a little bit of damage in return themselves and trying to at least push into this smoke and see if they can clean it up. This is actually going a little bit slower than I thought it might have. They're able to hold each other off between the Apex Warlords and to NPC a little bit of a now a standoff as it didn't clean up instantly on that first push as they would have liked so now both squads have an opportunity to really do something here here's those blue shields we're talking about though on the side of Apex Warlords so they've done well for themselves to hold the other squad off they have and that's the beauty of caustic right you get some barrels down you deny some lines of sight you slow everything down and it allows you to elongate this fight now it looks like they're trying to leave it looks like they might have found a solo which is going to be actually excuse me it's not going to be a solo as a player trying to make a flank and it's going to be a 2v2 now between the warlords and npc Shiv's going to look for the finish here so he can get that armor swap and at least put himself in a position to maybe get back into this fight Seraphim's going to get another finish himself Shiv's going to slide out beautiful movement from the warlord but he'll go down as well and it's all up to Zera for now he reloads he can't quite snap on and that will finally be the apex warlords falling even though they've got 26 points on the board decent amount of points but now npc also gonna have to start making a move so that they don't get tagged by this additional damage like we said that was a really long engagement and now they are about to be gate kept by atlas who can see them pushing towards them moving into this choke will be an opportunity for some kp for atlas to maybe clean up a potentially weakened and now down to two team when it comes to npc but nobody really wanting to take extra damage if they don't have to meanwhile i say that one on npc does go down to the ring so they're going to decide to try and wrap away from atlas and we'll end up running into yet another squad. And I don't know if you saw way back when the map just came up before Mark, but the zone shift and continues to shift directly on top of Red Dragon's solo nut building. I don't know how this is going in their favor, but right now they are set up beautifully. Yeah, I think they were probably as surprised as anyone to walk up and go, hey, this is free. 
Let's just go in here because this is where the game's going to end. <laughs> like it's, uh, somebody messed up along the way. And I don't know who left, if someone was forced to leave, but you can't allow a team to walk in that late to one of the priority positions. And like you say, they are bang central in that next zone. And they are in the, like you say, the only nut building which is going to be safe in the zone. So they're not going to have to do anything. There's a real opportunity here for them to win match point. And even though we have more guaranteed ga games to come, to not only win it, but guarantee their spot in Pro League. Absolute insanity. Meanwhile, the rest of our squad still fighting for those spots. One of those being kneecap. Someone who we saw with really nice shields earlier on now fighting in this choke up against quite a few squads. This is not going to be easy. You've got Shamani in there. Deadfish also trying to look and see if they can maybe third party this and get some free KP. They've been on the outside of this choke and kind of watching the action go down. Deadfish doing a really good job holding their own, staying alive. You were talking about how important this watch and gen has been for them. These fences as well, giving them a little bit of space to move around without anyone getting too close so this has provided dead fish the space that they were looking for to be able to do this additional damage meanwhile shamani down to one i believe kneecap split in a 2-1 trying to just make their way through this choke and atlas coming up on the other side behind dead fish which might switch dead fish's focus yeah this is what we were talking about right when we were saying moving from the south to the north on this zone is rough unless you've got like very high evos and you are the last team to arrive and you're seeing that right now because Atlas have moved in. Shimani, who are holding down a lot of those chokes, they've been eliminated as well. And now you're seeing Dead Fish, who did have one player go down as well. Now they're getting focused by numerous teams. And as that zone shifts away from where they are holding, they are running into teams who just have a health advantage when it comes to the Evos. Dead Fish gone, Kneecap gone as well. We're down to our top six. Everything is happening really quickly as, as it does towards these final moments. The fact that it's still only Red Dragon who is 100% safe in the building inside of this final circle right now. You see SPS starting to fly in. Atlas still hanging out on these outskirts as they know that it's going to be a little bit of a rough final rotation. They're taking some poke damage from the team still in the nut buildings right now who have some sight lines on them. And this is a nice overview of exactly where everybody is. You can see those rampart walls and that loba behind the rock over there. That might at least be helpful when it comes to trying to be annoying from behind that rock with everybody else being in a little bit better cover that's free sosa over on the side and i think this is how 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 are they this blessed i can't how give you answers just, i just <laughs> I, can't, I can't give you answers it's it's all i can say i mean they say a picture tells a thousand words right like look at that red dragon only team in zone right now everyone else has to make their way in the two teams are on the northern side of the zone they have to walk out into the open will probably take damage from free sosa that northern side should be clean up crew the worry i think for red dragon is the southern side atlas they know they're there they know they're trying they've tried to do some damage it sounds crazy but the fact that they've got a trident to play with here they could just boost to the bottom of that building and play underneath with a little bit of cover using that trident so atlas could cause a problem here they don't have the best of evos but if other teams could do a little bit of damage to red dragon there might be an opportunity to keep this thing going it's going to be rough because everybody keeps looking at atlas every forward. time they move but they're trying to go for the all oh, this a metal of damage that just got absolutely rained down on atlas as they go down in the kill feed they went for the big plays mark but it didn't work i respect it the whole lobby focused them <laughs> that's wasn't part of the script i will say that free sosa down to just one digi's gonna be into the void and try to stay alive for now four squads now remaining and surprise surprise red dragon as a full three just standing here at the moment looking to close things out this is their opportunity here lauren this is their opportunity everyone at home to claim match point this early and you combine that with the fact that they have the caustic keeping people away from them. They've got the bang to block the vision and sight lines. I mean, they're in such a strong position in this nut building right now. Everyone has to come to them. They're going to be able to drop down last when it comes to that final circle as well. Free Sosa going out in the kill feed now down to top three. Red Dragon, the only one inside of the building. Trojan under them and Call Me Data moving in right now. They also have ults available. Very importantly, you can see the ult excels being popped. I'm pretty sure that every single legend had their ultimate available. So they can bang out. If anyone tries to climb up late, then force them off. They can then use the caustic ult to obviously you know, throw it down onto the teams who are forced down to the low ground. Then they can smoke and bang 
Uh, excuse me, Bloodhound scan to find out where everyone is. So they're in a great spot here, but Call Me Dada could be the party poopers here. You see the Evo they've managed to work their way up to. If they have the ability to use this, I don't need the late Evac might actually be a big play for them as well. But they also have ultimates available to counteract what Red Dragon have. And I like the, the call that this might be the spoiler in Call Me Data as well, because I mean, between the options for height that they could utilize on their comp, this might be an opportunity for them to outlive everybody when it does shrink down to that final ring. You can see Red Dragon knowing where they are and trying to do whatever they can, if they can do a little bit of poke damage before this next circle shrinks down. But this is all going to come down to perfect decision-making. Trojan has made their way on top of the building, now above Red Dragon, who will obviously know that that's where they are it might give them better sight lines down below and to call me data it's just that last push who is the last one to move out i mean trojan are doing red dragon a favor here because they are outputting damage onto call me data who have to move first nades are going to go in as well and just remember red dragon still have that bang Ooh. on so the height they can give it up early here they're not going to be too bothered about it but look at this now the game is going to be almost handed to them as call me data send it up onto the high ground with the horizon lift where are red dragon call me data are eliminated champion it had never been done inside the allotted amount of games until now red dragon win match point what just happened there is no way absolutely no way what i the i talked about the choices and how important they were gonna be going for trojan on the top was not the choice that was not it that's what like you said is what handed the game to red dragon because they didn't go for them and put themselves in the position to be third partied by red dragon i i don't that is that the fastest i think in the history of apex that might be the fastest match point we've ever had that was three games right three games first one that we saw on storm point that might well be a record for match point to be one i will say by the way let's not take away they might not have known the red dragon were in that building so that becomes True. like a little bit of a guessing game, right? But I will say for Red Dragon on match point to be handed the game in the way that they have been at numerous points throughout that game, they are going to be like, like blessed. Just cannot believe their luck. They get the building that is the one open <laughs> yes. after everyone is contesting it. Open. Nobody's there to stop them. They have an amazing Evo path in where they managed to get up to purples, almost reds without any, tr any trouble whatsoever. And in the final moment, the two teams who can deny them match point and qualifying for Pro League decide to just go in against each other, play for second, and that just hands them the win. It's such a simple job. Congratulations to Red Dragon. They will be in Pro League in EMEA for split two. I mean, with a performance like that, it's very well deserved. I want to get Vicky back in here too because I I can only imagine the screaming that was happening with Vicky <laughs> behind the scenes while you were watching that. I mean... Oh, Vicky, give me give me your thoughts on what we just saw. I I think that was record breaking. Like there, that has to. Oh, oh you might sorry. Be here, I, I got so I got yeah, so yeah, excited. Okay. I, yeah, yeah, okay. I was gonna say that has to be record breaking. Not only did they just freaking farm the lobby after game two, but the back to back win and then the free end zone and then Prestis is just out here destroying everybody else. Like the man's got like four point two k damage alone. I think before that game, like just to put it into perspective. So imagine after game three, Red Dragon. I mean the two teams that I was looking at going into it today was red dragon and danish and red dragon just not only performed but they slayed and conquered and now it's free pickings for the other teams to see where they stand in the next few games since we are forced to play out a total of six games despite red dragons winning after three games uh, i may maybe I'm a bit maybe shock here what about you like that has to be a record that has to be a record. i don't think we've ever yeah. seen that yeah no there's no way we have I feel like maybe they were everyone's mindset was like if maybe if Red Dragon wins, we don't have to worry about them anymore. I don't I don't I can't I can't come up with it. I I mean you could say that if they hadn't just like wiped everyone in the previous game, right? Because now they've true. got to worry about Red Dragon playing without any pressure. They could just run at everyone if they wanted to, right? They could just smash their way through lobbies and see if they can set even more records now. But I mean I think the biggest takeaway, of course, is congratulations to Red Dragon right mm. now. They have qualified. Like, amazing yeah. performance, record-breaking performance. Nobody would have seen that coming, but there's still more Apex to play here. We have three more games to decide who is going to be joining them, and 
I mean, I, I've got to be honest, I'm in a bit of shock. I did not come into today thinking that we would have a match point winner after three games. I'm kind of blown away. It, it actually will change how a lot of these teams are going to be playing moving forward, though, because typically we're waiting until five or six for people to start getting into that match point area. It gets hit in two, finished in three, which means now there's a, a, a set limit, right? There's not this potential endless amount of games for these teams to be getting points on the board. You have three more opportunities to be in that top eight, okay? It's our top eight that are getting the spots into split two. One is now gone, so it's only seven more remaining spots for these teams to make their way into split two. And I think that could change a lot when it comes to the mental side of it, Vicky, because it's no longer match point. We're back to what they're used to with just a set series. Yeah, but I also think that just that sets up Red Dragon to be like the team that is up here and then a huge gap and then the rest <laughs> of this lobby to put it into perspective on uh, what to expect for split two. I mean, Red Dragon has got it just unlocked. I mean, I'm not surprised. Honestly, Taskmaster not playing in the Pro League is already a surprise on its own for me. And then to see him alongside two insanely cracked teammates, I can't wait to see what Red Dragon does in the Pro League. I mean, we're, we're, we're one for two right now with teams that I think everybody expected to do well. We'll have to see what Danish can bring to the table after uh, we get into this next match. But before we do that, we're three matches in, which means it's time for halftime, okay? We get to bring in some really cool guests every time we get to this point of the show. And we've got a great one today, okay? We've got a special guest who we get to see at LAN with us as one of our guests analysts. So this is just a little bit of a preview of that. Graceful is back. We're so excited to have him on the show. Before we even start talking about the chaos that we just saw, Graceful, because I'm sure you've got a lot to say about it, I just want to know how excited you are to be back on the desk with us at LAN. Yeah, it's going to be so much fun to be trying a, a completely different perspective of Apex, you know, from being a former pro player to uh, trying my best to be on the analyst desk, and we'll see maybe the future cast if I'm lucky. <laughs> Having so much fun just, you know, exploring Apex in different venues. Um, I think the Apex that we've seen today and Apex as we've seen, the Apex that I used to play back in the day, it's so vastly different and it's currently evolving. And we're seeing many teams pop off in different ways and it's always so much fun. All right, I'll jump in. Sorry, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. I'll jump in with a quick question here because I'm going to go with the most obvious question. Like, what just happened? <laughs> <laughs> Literally, three games... <laughs> Okay. <laughs> what just happened from your point of view? So, I mean, the first two games for me, like, I've been following them the whole way as well, right? The first two games look literally like textbook because they have defaults, which is what I like to say for pre-plans that's outside of the game for games that are about to happen. So the zone endings that they had, both the Trials ones and then also around Mirage as well, or actually rather the, the train rail, is a default place for them. They play the same way every single game that the zones end up there. So... They played those two amazingly. They played proactive and they got points. And when we say, like, when we look at Red Dragons, they, they get consistent points regardless. Like, their worst game is never zero because they will always take one team down with them. But when they're being so proactive and then, like, they're opening up and thinning out the edge as they're walking in and then fighting for god spots, essentially, and power spots, they're just, like, racking up so many points the first two games. It was, it was you know, domination. The third game, however, I will say a little bit free. Like... A lot of the times, <laughs> God spots shouldn't be free, and one of the spots was a little bit too free. But in the end, they were proactive, and you know, maybe a little bit of luck is what you need in BR as well, right? And that opened up for it. But they managed to close it out. I would like to say that they closed it out perfectly, but let's be honest. I think the team on the down low maybe they didn't know that uh, Red Dragons was a team inside and not the team outside, but they just sent it and they traded, and it was completely free. But overall, like. Not even counting only this tournament, but the whole season for them have been amazing. And I knew from day one they should have been in Pro League. You know, that's where I'm at. They should be, like, top 10 in Pro League minimum. They could even make a bigger splash if they get a few other things under control. But they they are really strong. 
Yeah, I, I think a lot of people would agree with you there. I was, generally, I was surprised. Again, like Taskmaster as an individual, just so talented. But you know what? Talking about those last three games, I want to pick your brain, Graceful, because I love I love it whenever we sit down. We've bombarded the devs before in the past. Now we're going to bombard the audience out here. Uh, you talked about it a little bit um, for the end circles for game number one. Let's go through the final circles for these last three games, starting with that first game that pulled towards Grandma's house, north side of Trial. You mentioned that Red Dragon's the type of team that even if they don't win they still put in mad points and they got 11 kills this game what do you think happened here i mean this is one of those brutal final circles graceful that if you're not here early you definitely pay for it in the sense get in this end circle yeah so i think well we don't really see their perspective right now but this zone in general is that like once you get the i would say the four main spots of this circle which is tower which is the buildings that you see right in front of you which is top and underneath trials those are the teams that are just looking to hold the teams out but when we're talking about, you know, Red Dragons for a specific thing, this zone and they had 11 kills, they're on the opposite spectrum where they're playing really late on the zone and really late on the edge, clearing, like, thinning everything out and eventually taking the fights on these teams that you see currently that uh, they, they're just way more stacked. Like, they're coming in, red armor's full swinging at you and even if you're, you know, even if they take you down, they could get thirded or held out. Like, Danish closed out the first game, was really good. They're the ones who's, like, there's so many teams, like, this is the biggest issue in general, is that a lot of teams try to do the same thing, which opens up opportunities for other teams to, to join in, essentially. Yeah, and in this final circle, they had literally farmed this lobby. They had, like, got a 19 KP. That's why they were set up in match point. But they had the high ground over all the other squads that were split up, and were also playing either as a solo or duo here for them. Yeah, a lot of the time, like, they put themselves in these spots where, like, they either uncontested or they just, like, okay, we're just gonna have to full send this team. And they're so good at closing out fights that they, like you see in this spot right now, they're just, you know, holding teams out essentially and then looking to jump down on anything, pounce on anything that they can and just, look, like, always fight for the kills. Like, as you see, they, you know, they get the three kills every single time. They always close out the team fights. And I think that if they can, like, they're so good at being proactive, sometimes they can, you know, get punished for being too proactive when there's too many teams on the same side but like as we've seen in these lobbies at least they are the like they, they are the powerhouse team and people are scared of them and they're just taking full advantage of that and they're popping off and in the opposite side of the spectrum here in game three they really they were proactive in getting the final circle but that was essentially served to them on a silver platter in this final circle with these other teams having to coexist like trojan on the high ground what do you think these other teams could have done knowing that dread dragon is literally playing right underneath them at match point yeah so trojan like this is the thing it depends on what knowledge each team had i'm pretty sure the team on the outside didn't have the knowledge on which team was red dragons maybe they made a bet that red dragons was on the roof and they made a misplay because that's a bad play in my opinion um i would like to hope that trojan like i'm pretty sure trojan knew that the red dragon was inside the building and they were just waiting to see like okay we're probably gonna kill the team that's walking in with the zone eventually we're gonna have to 3v3 red dragons but little did they know the horizon team ended up just hard fighting them and they ended up trading and that that made it a free fight for for red ranks and just three feet um i would say that uh, i would like to believe and assume that some of these teams didn't have the information needed to close out the game or like to further extend the games rather uh, to make sure that red dragons couldn't close it out but they ended up biting them in the butt because now they just made it for free like for red dragons and three feet as we get a chance to take a look at the match three results here, I mean, this is literally the the least kills we've seen out of Red Dragon because of how early they moved into that God spot, like you were saying here, Graceful. Obviously, still a stellar performance. Uh, as we take a look at some of the rest of these teams, though, we talked about Danish a lot. And for you, when you're watching for these first three matches, at least, Graceful, which of these teams do you think is going is looking good so far heading into now these final three matches so the thing is is that i have a hard time deciding because there's a lot of there's a lot of factors like going into when a team is performing when they're not a team that's doing bad on world's edge when they're a zone team and the zone mm -hmm. is complete opposite side of the map doesn't mean that they're bad a team that's you know playing on edge and then the zone ends up like landing on their py and they don't get to play edge with blue they ended up playing with white to blue armors you know in zone when their play style is edge it's not necessarily a bad team either it's all about the teams that are able to adapt to the circumstances and right now what i'm looking for is honest i'm not really looking into 
each individual team, but I'm looking for how they adapt to each zone depending on where their specific POIs are at. Because we've seen on World's Edge a little bit different, you know, compared to Stormpoint, is that teams are shifting around their playstyle. Some like to play more edge on Stormpoint because it's a lot easier. You're, you're never held as much. Whereas like on the World's Edge, a lot of teams pre tend to prefer zone play because there's so many houses and whatnot that you can get early and there's more table god spots, so to say. So I'm, I'm just looking for the adaptation and then I'll root for whichever team, you know. I would like to say uh, Danish to, to show up a little bit more because I have played against them a lot in the past. Um, but I'm also looking for Apex Warlords because, you know, friendships. <laughs> oh, absolutely, absolutely. And now we get a chance to see the confirmed standings right now. Red Dragon landing their spot in split two with 71 points, finishing match point in three. Phenomenal performance on behalf of Red Dragon and just got confirmation for everybody at home. Just so that you understand, Red Dragon will not be participating in the final three games. They'll drop out of the lobby, so it'll just be down to 19, and the rest of these teams can fight out against each other to continue getting some points and hopefully getting those final seven spots. As always, it's been absolutely lovely having you here on the show to chat with us, Graceful. Uh, thank you so much for hanging out and giving us all of your fantastic analysis. I can't wait to see you back here again. Thank you so much for having me, and I'll see you guys soon, and bye. All right. Uh, first time being able to see it confirmed there. Uh, phenomenal, phenomenal job. I think we'll probably be talking about it all day. For now, Onset, it's time for you to take a break. So we'll let you go. We'll get Gaskin back on in here. And uh, Vicky, let's get into the next match. Let's get it going. Red Dragons, they may have won match point, but Dan, we got some more Apex that needs to be played because we got seven more teams that are vying for those seven spots to compete in the Split 2 Pro League. What on earth happened there? I step away for one game and suddenly we get records broken and we get Red Dragon just dominating yet again. But yes, you quite rightly alluding to the fact there's still more Apex to play, still more Pro League positions to fight for. And now with Red Dragon dropping out, it's a little bit more fair because the rest of the lobby isn't going to get decimated from what we've just seen. Now is this going to be the chance for the likes of Danish to step up again after their first victory in match number one? But we get to see Stormpoint again here. I'm excited to see what goes down, but... This is going to be very competitive when we look from two downward here, Vicky. And I, I think that, you know, there's a lot to still play for. I was going to say, you know, it, it takes away the opportunity to get 3kp with Red Dragon not being in this lobby. But honestly, looking at the, the gap between Red Dragon and the rest of the lobby, I don't even think that would have been possible for the other teams to try to take a fair 3v3 fight against that crazy squad. Game number four with Red Dragon's absence. Let's see how this plays out here. Final game on Stormpoint before we make that transition into World's Edge, where we will be playing the final two games of the day. Well, the teams are dropping, and they are ready to... Lock and load into match number four then. We'll have to see whether we see any early scraps happening now that we get an extra POI. Uh, it shouldn't really happen, but if I'm the rest of the lobby, I'm probably thinking, well, actually, now that Red Dragon have left, we have one of the better POIs available to us, so we should probably maybe head over there after what we just saw Red Dragon do. And you can see a couple of teams are heading in that direction. We have a lot of squads up in the northeast right now. In terms of the circle... Well, let's find out where we're going to be heading. It looks like it's going to be southeast. We're going to be heading down towards Pylon and the surrounding areas. Surely not Echo HQ. Surely I don't carry this curse everywhere I go, but we're going to have to see you at the southern east zone. More of these squads taking their time to rotate. Atlas, though, already quick on that rotate from Jurassic. They got the ring console there as well. So more information for more of these squads to take advantage of. Even looking at Shamani, the team that lands by Devastated Coast. They're going to be able to have not only the ring console, but also the survey beacon as well. They could also deny that space away from OR9. But I want to focus more on that middle of the pack teams. Now that Red Dragon is already qualified, they won match points. I'm talking about Danish, the team that won game number one and how they're going to be able to approach this exiting out of down beast with all that loot that down beast has to offer yeah there's gonna be plenty available for them and just in general the map should be opened up a little bit more danish, danish at the moment second in 39 points uh behind them you have trojan on 34 then atlas and apxw on 27 and 26 respectively so there are 
you know, there's a little bit of a lead for the likes of Danish and Trojan, and we did bring up literally Red Dragon, Danish, Trojan at the start of this show, and they are our front three teams. But now with three games to play, and it is all about gaining those points, about just creating that gap to stay as far away, a win could be massive for any of these teams that are anywhere downward from second place here. Even if you are one of the squads who's down in 17th, for example, you could still find a victory, push yourself up into that top eight, and then try and maintain it here. So each game is going to get more and more nervy as we get on, but match four here is the biggest chance to kind of set things straight with now Red Dragon leaving. On that quick rotate here, looking at some of these other squads. Exiting out of the pylon spot, though, going to be able to call in another evac. Talk about trying to quickly go in for some of these rotates. They're getting hit from two different POIs launch pad, and even the bridge that Shamani has controlled, too. Atlas, a little bit of a trouble, and now delaying their rotate with the evac towers, and they are still rocking that white Evo shield. This is the risk when it comes to going for these quick rotates, because then you don't really know the other squads and the Evo harvesters of where they've been able to take advantage of their POIs. Well, SPS... One of the teams rocking the rampart, losing out on that rampart already, and now looking like they want to back away, actually, and play this out as a duo. Yeah, OR9 are in eighth position at the moment, so that is the cutoff uh, almost for Pro League spots. You've got to imagine that they will be a little bit nervous right now. They have had some games where they were eliminated a little bit early, but they were able to maybe have one player survive and rat out, and those extra points when you do rat out to a few more placement positions can be imperative for your qualification for Pro League here. But it is nice, Vicky, that we get to start seeing some new faces and potentially names and faces that we might be seeing a lot of in the future if they do get that qualification into Pro League competing in Split 2. And then who knows, maybe if they have a successful Split 2, they might be able to find themselves at the World Championships as well. Mm, literally the future of the ALGS is here to stay. Deadfish with the, the longbow is going to be able to get that knock. Tries to get the follow-up. I love the back and forth that we're seeing, though, from Deadfish. Was able to get that follow-up shot after making them weak initially, and they are going to be able to close in the gap, but having to be careful, trying to push that in with very low health in general, having to forcibly pop that med kit. But we're trying to fully engage, but this is the question here for these final end circles and Echo HQ. Huge nade, by the way, but do you want to give up this space knowing that there's going to be more squads that are going to be rotating from behind you, specifically that choke that leads away from Coastal Camp. Yeah, there's a few people that are moving in the same way, but just, as you mentioned, a little bit further behind than one or the other, and you may eventually have to make the decision just to maybe change your direction ever so slightly and just accept where you have found yourself. And it's always the tough decision. How much further do you push on your rotation? How much luck do you want to try and ride really is there going to be another team that's ahead of us is there going to be a building that's available to push through on at the moment urgency are going to be in an okay spot around just to the east of pylon but it's whether they try and get into a more comfortable position if you are going to play one of these more open areas you have to be very confident in your gunplay uh, about providing cover to your teammates when they're healing for example so some teams prefer just to just hunker down and play a building instead Look how interesting this loadout is here, too. This legend composition of the Rampart, Wraith, and Loba. They stuck with this composition from World's Edge, now using the same comp going into Storm Point. So many different comp diversities when it comes to going into Storm Point, usually, like Urgency, Rocking the Horizon. We saw what happened with Kamidata when they tried utilizing the Horizon Gravity Lift in the final circle, ended up inting on top of that high ground of the DBZ building. Now looking at more teams to see how they try to utilize these different legend comps and seeing which direction they want to try to rotate into that next circle speaking of rotating speaking of moving and grooving here comes danish to try and make maybe a decision as to where they would like to head at the moment just using cover and trying to eye out where they can position themselves always risky in the trident we saw at the end of match number three it looks like it's just going to be making sure they pick up the Harvester on their way, and they're up to purples now. So Danish, who are going to be the front runners in this lobby with Red Dragon leaving, definitely where our eyes have to constantly be glancing towards. They looked really good in match number one and even two, so it's not like they should be too disheartened with the fact that Red Dragon have won this thing. They can still qualify for Pro League, but a team that might struggle if they keep getting eliminated. Free Sosa, they go down, but Forbidden are going to be on the better side of things. They're in seventh position at the moment. 
And those late rotates, very tricky, especially if you're not trying to take advantage of a Wraith portal in a situation like this. I mean, Forbidden has gotten this bunker locked down with the Cossack Barrels. They also have the Bloodhound scan. They did get scanned earlier by another team in the distance, but this is what we can expect with these Echo HQ final zones. There's a lot of place to coexist for multiple teams, so you're going to have more teams alive in this final zone. And that zone is going to be a tricky one. Look at how much of the zone is taken up by the mountain just on the northern side of that circle that you see. You can see Apex Warlords are going to be in a position where they would be okay in that circle on the northeast, but then it's likely going to continue to pull down south. We have seen the circle eh, a lot in Apex Legends. As you said, Vicky, maybe you're the curse and you're the reason why we're seeing this circle, <laughs> but that's okay because now you'll be able to tell us exactly how it's going to play out and who is going to be the victor because you've seen it so many times. Usually, it's the team that has the POI advantage, especially since they like to wait pretty and poke out a lot of teams in the distance. But some teams taking their time to rotate. Players and rolling teams who is exiting out of the bunker of Command Center as players have activated the Beast of the Hunt. They try to get a scan, but it's a fight for utility. They're going to be able to get that death box, get all the extra equipment that they need. It's about sending a message here in controlling this space and forcing rolling teams to decide, do they want to take this fight? Do they even have time to take this fight? You got, what, less than 40 seconds now before that next circle closes in? And more teams calling in the evac tower to try to get ahead of the curve. Teams playing on the edge like window cleaners. You have Trojan now landing in front of all the chaos, trying to find themselves a little lip to get out of the LOS of other squads that are looking in their direction. Mosin just trying to dip, dodge, and dive to stay alive at the moment. They are, they are able to tuck themselves into a corner here. Trojan just needs to be a little bit careful they don't get spotted out by another team to their north, but they should be okay. Caustic Barrel starting to go down, and now Trojan can start to think about how they want to set up for this end game because when you look at where this circle is going, it is going to come down towards where Trojan currently resides, so they're in a good spot. They just need to make sure that they can maybe show a little bit more presence to stop teams walking up on them for free. Meanwhile, a whole other game is being played over by Command Center. This fight is still going on as players still trying to gatekeep this team from even exiting out of the bunker, but they got to start moving soon. What is good here in a situation like this, they did force this team to now play this out as a duo, but they're also farming Evil Shield. Both teams have purple players coming out as the victors on top of this 2v3 now have a red on their side so going into that next circle they're going to come out with a health advantage compared to teams like or9 for example who are lacking not only in the evil shield charge since they still are on blue but maybe even in, on the ammo department since they've been staying on this catwalk this whole time Oh, Danish are making a very interesting rotation now and good catch by the observers. I saw it on the map feed and we hop straight to it. Right on this southern tip is where Danish are trying to sneak in, but they've been spotted out and they need a chance just to reset here and they may get it because it's a difficult angle to try and attack someone who is under this metal grate stairwell. And Danish are going to be able to heal up and should be able to reset comfortably. So it's a great rotation from them. It was certainly a risky one. Had they been spotted a little bit sooner, it could have been bad news bears, but... Now they get the chance to try and assess how they want to approach this circle. What I also like to see here too is Young Hong Kong taking advantage of the refuge perk, which you, with the heal rate now increased to 3.5 HP per second versus the 3 HP it was. That 0.5 does make a difference in trying to reset quickly on a landing. And now with Danish playing on the stairwell over to the side, we've seen this being done plenty of times by the likes of even Moist and Dark Zero. And now with Danish waiting here, seeing the other squads that are going to be rotating, that smoke is going to be the heal Mary that they need to put them out of the line of sight of the squad that is inside of Echo HQ being dead fish looking at them still seven teams outside of this next circle and it's gonna start to close soon rolling teams are still in the red by the way on that northern side so they're gonna be the team that has to move uh the furthest but i, I think players have got an idea of where rolling teams are you can see they're heading towards them on the north they might have heard something it might have given them an audio cue as to go on the chase here and go on the hunt but they're gonna be Maybe running themselves into danger. They do have to be careful. It's window cleaners and urgency who are the team who are likely to fight, as well as OR9 and SPS on that right-hand side. Both the teams, if they win their fight, are still going to have to fight through someone else, most likely, to be able to push to that circle because window cleaners and urgency don't want to get caught on that northwest side of the mountain. They're going to have to decide whether they want to go up and around towards the east or down towards the southwest. 
and Rolling Teams managed to get away from players and they got a replicator, so maybe they were able to craft a banner. We're gonna have to tune into that chaos soon as we take a look at the teams fighting on the edge here. You mentioned window window cleaners and urgency, two teams that have taken their time to make the rotate into that next circle, just buying themselves a time with this lobby dwindling down. And meanwhile, the Rampart is setting up shop inside of the tunnels right underneath Launchpad. This is going to be SPS versus OR9. Two teams that have also been fighting since Circle 1. And SPS kind of holding out OR9 at the mo moment as well. And a decision has to be made in the next uh, 10 seconds because Circle's about to close. They do have an evac tower to work with by the looks of it, but will they even get the chance? There's now other teams also getting pushed together. It is going to be urgency and window cleaners, but Kenny can't quite get all the damage he wanted with the Prowler, and now it's just going to be Entity as the last remaining player on window cleaners. May be able to get a revive here, though, because the other team has dropped below them. They got enough Windex out here to clean up shop, but is it going to be enough for them to get the reset? Entity comes in with the suppressed fire, gets the crack. Can he get the finishing blow, though? Trying to run for his life. That's still a Vista urgency. They do come out on top, but here is the third party perfectly on cue. And noting that Entity's trying to get away. Players, though, have not stopped trying to grief the edge of the teams. The teams that play more so by the edge, players have taken their time with the rotate and now have been able to move in. One of the teams to also rock the line lifeline as we move more so towards a lifeline meta with the changes that we saw in the last update they get the last straggler of window cleaners and they take control of this side of the circle but where do players go now is my real question they have to hope for an evac tower to try and go up and over the mountain perhaps but they certainly aren't going to get the chance to go southwest because rolling teams who they were chasing a little bit earlier is going to hold them out so now players are just going to have to play this side of the circle there is a chance they could maybe go through the red on the northern side, but again, Apex Warlords are going to be there, so players are in a tough spot, quite literally between a rock and a hard place right now. Oh, no way. That's rolling teams. They finally got rolling teams. It took them about two circles, but now finding them in a tough spot in the corner of that circle, they clean up the remainder of the squad with 12 teams remaining here. Maybe they got an evac tower to work with as well, Dan. We're going to have to see with this tricky rotate, because even if they do take a little bit of circle damage to the north side, we know how many squads are going to be waiting for them. I mean, look at Apex Warlords now going to be rotating from the other side here, playing underneath the bridge. Well, we do wait and see where Apex Warlords wants to rotate with the Kraber in hand for Xerifer. Let's jump into a listen and see their next plan. They got power. They, they, you have just to take and knock one. You have to knock one. Yeah, yeah. Should I, I piss off this team? Or the... No, you have to focus this team, Zary. Hey, look, they're yeah. on, on my ping, sitting up here. Hold up, hold up, hold up. I'm looking, I'm looking. Might get ahead of here. One forty on left lane. I'm, I'm moving forward. Moving forward. You have to smoke this guy. Smoke this guy. And bang on. Bang on. Bang on. One forty. One forty. One twenty. One twenty. Yo, the bang is low. The bang is low. We need to kill her. I'm waiting for the bang outs. Pushing afterwards. Moving up now with bang out. Twenty four one. Still in that corner. Nading it. Nice. I'm moving forward. Moving forward. Do it. Moving forward. Move up. Move up. I'm closing. Bang one, bang dead, bang dead, bang dead, bang dead. Push, push, push. Yeah, yeah. Yep. What is it? One more step right. One more step right, I think. Yep. Yeah. Above you, above you. You're 40 on him, 40 on him. Can you get pushed out? Yeah, I'm climbing. He's alone, he's alone. He's dead, 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 dead. Nice, nice, dead. I'm climbing. Look in front of you, please. Look, 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 look. Keep yeah, full team here. Can we... Yeah. No, it's okay. Guys, we need to kill bottom left. We're in zone, we're in zone, just play yo, yo, on yo, us! Listen to me! What, 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 me? Yeah, look at me, Zoe. Can we get these skills here? Can we get these skills here? Need, for that. Guy crossing the open! Kraber shot after Kraber shot, Xerifer opens up the pathway for the rest of Apex Warlords to take up the space that they need. Behind the rampart walls, they put in the pressure, but with nine squads in counting, eight squads now left with Kamidata going down, they get another knock to push in! It's a great knock and you could hear the comms. They were so passionate about it and how urgent they had to be with that push. They couldn't afford to be too slow. Otherwise, they would have given the opportunity to the other team to reset. And now the Apex Warlords, they're up to fourth position. They are in a good spot for qualification into Pro League. It's still early days. We still have two more matches, but being in that top eight as you get into the latter stages is always going to put you in a better spot. Now, all the meanwhile, whilst we were watching Apex Warlords, players did manage to get an evac tower and rotate on the southwest side 
over everyone else and now find themselves pretty much center zone. So fair play to players have been able to do that off screen and they've got reds as well, Vicky. They're actually in a fantastic spot now. Oh, making their way downtown, clearing the lobby and looking at it all in the past. Five squads left, another team to fall victim to players right now. Full red Evo and they're doing this all repping the gold Mozambique. Did you see that? The gold shotgun choke on there. You got the digi. It's been beautiful. We saw that earlier on, actually. I believe it was Danish that had basically the hammies on the RE45 and the digi on top of it. So powerful when it comes to these lobbies. Now that you could put that digi on the pistol and it doesn't have to be only rocked on the car or R9, any of those SMGs here. But taking a look at this next circle and where it's going to be pulling, you mentioned players, but Apex Warlord, they are on the high ground, but they do have to give up the space eventually. Four squads remaining. One of them is a two of SPS. Deadfish also kind of cowering on that southeast side may just be a two themselves. So like who it is, this is players versus Apex Warlords with a sprinkle of damage from twos. Now twos can still win, so I'm not going to put it out of the realms of possibility, but with the Kraber in hand, maybe it gives a little bit of an advantage to the Apex Warlords, especially if Zeri can hit any of these shots. Are they going to push to try and find space on this northern side? Yes, they are. They just have to be careful about SPS who are just above them. And they know too, right over to the right side. SPF is still not in the circle though. Once the circle is closing in right behind them, he's gonna have to drop soon. They're pinging him. Apex Warlord's looking at him at the same time, but cannot focus on him entirely. Dead Fish, the other solo, get eliminated. Our final three squads left in this lobby. SPS as a solo, Apex Warlords and players on the ah. other side. Spot it out. Now it's a straight 3v3 then. Players versus Apex Warlords. You've got seventh position players against the Warlords who are now up into the top four. This could be huge for both of these teams' chances to qualify for Pro League in the grand scheme of things. At the moment, the high ground is held by players. But what ultimates do we have available? They did have the lifeline, which could come in handy if they were able to get a player knocked, but then maybe just get a little tippy-tap to get back into the fight. We'll have to see how this one plays out. But another 20 seconds before the circle starts to force them together. And we can confidently assume, too, that Lifeline definitely has the gold knockdown after the Lifeline changes that we saw recently in the last patch, too. So Apex Warlords don't have that support legend advantage, but they do have a Kraber. Seraphor is uh -oh. going to have to clutch it out, but the Archers are going to have to wean them out of there, photo them out from cover. The smokes are going to come in handy here, but players are feeling confident. They drop down from the high ground. They get the scan, and they want to capitalize. Yeah, players on the push now. Is that going to try and do the damage with the Havoc? Is going to have support, but now with the smoke, we're going to see the Apex Warlords push out. They get a knock. It's a trade one for one, but now it's going to be a two versus one with players having the advantage, and they will sweep it up as players take match number four here and give themselves a real shot of qualifying for the Pro League. And it comes to question, with that confidence, that momentum, they are absolutely carrying that into World's Edge, Dan, because they just took that game with heavy KP, and they took their time to rotate into that next zone, which could be so detrimental for an Echo HQ zone usually. And you've got to look at how they did it as well. When they were on that kind of northwest side of the mountain and the rotation looked like it was going to be really tough, we switched over for a listening to the Warlords. And I was just keeping a keen eye on that map feed because I was like, are they going to go north or south here? North would have given them a straight 3v3 versus Warlords, but they went for the dramatic attempt of going through the south where there was like three or four teams they had to fly over, but they almost used the distraction of the time that they went. Everyone was looking at other things. Everyone was a little bit kind of perplexed at what was happening because the zone was coming in and they just went kind of through the madness into center zone and then because they had the red uh, evos to work with as well at that point they're going to be feeling confident they're going to be doing the damage and then the final 3v3 once we saw the warlord stuck behind that rock it was going to be a case of does the kraber shot hit if the kraber shot had hit could have been different for the warlords however it did not and Zerfer, even to the last remaining breath with him hiding behind that rock, he tried to go for a hip fire shot on the Kraber. I heard it ring through my headset, and unfortunately, that shot did not land. Players were dominating from the beginning to the middle part of that game. They're harassing rolling teams who was trying to get out of command center. That's how they farmed their evil shield at the very beginning anyways. Well, everybody was focused and fixated on trying to rotate to a better spot in Echo HU. And since they were so focused on that and they were fighting each other, like you mentioned, Dan, Players just had a very easy way to use that evac tower after all the death boxes were strewn upon their feet, and they were able to get into a way better spot off the fence line of Echo. 
And you can see what a difference it makes having a game like that as well. Players were down in the bottom 15 or whatever, and then now they're up into the top five, I think. So this is going to be their chance to try and solidify themselves within that top eight and now stay there for the next two remaining matches. The same could be said for the Apex Warlords. It wouldn't be a pro league without Shiv. I'm going to be completely honest. So there's a, a part of me that kind of is rooting for the Warlords because it would be weird to see it not include Shiv and the rest of the guys. But... They were able to get second place. They were able to get a good amount of kills. They certainly have given themselves a good opportunity at Pro League. But with two matches still to play, anything can still happen. And that means for the teams that are still struggling a little bit, there is still life left. But it's starting to get to crunch time now. It's crazy. You, you talk about it, but the players being in the 19th spot overall in this lobby now finishing off with like a 15 KP game, a dub on top of it. Apex Warlords, I definitely agree. Without Shiv in the Pro League, it seems a little off. I'm so used to seeing Shiv in general, but we have the results this time around. Let's take a look at where our teams are standing after that game here alone. The game, though, ends up with players not only taking first place, it is with 15 KP, securing themselves 27 total points. Huge game for them as Apex Warlords comes in second with 5kp. They were able to get that on top of Deadfish, who actually was able to secure 9kp too while they were fighting inside of Echo HQ. Once again, that was their POI, so they were able to clear a lot of other teams that were trying to funnel their way into Echo. And this is really being a day of just big bomb scores from some of these teams. 27 points from players. We saw a 30-point game previously from Red Dragon. It seems like when a team starts to get rolling, the momentum really carries them through. And that's certainly a good sign here for players who now push themselves up the leaderboards. It didn't mean there was very many points left to share for some squads, but those one points, those two points, they could make the difference when it comes down to it with that top eight. Danish only getting the one point, but remember, they were in second place coming into things so they're still going to be in a good position the teams that are struggling a little bit that maybe could have performed a little bit better today based off of their performance yesterday the likes of dn for example they were sixth coming out of the performance from the winner's bracket yesterday's games and they are still struggling at the bottom of the table they weren't able to pick up any points in match number four even Atlas, too, who before that game, I believe they were in top five, uh, right behind Trojan, and unfortunately being the first team to go out after that fourth game alone. But now, with some information on where our teams are standing here, the points that they were able to get after four games alone, we still got two more games of Apex left to play. I can't wait to see it, Dan. Let's go to a break, and on the other side of this, we'll see you on World's Edge. Welcome back, everybody, to the AOGS PLQ. Lots of letters and lots of victors today, Dan, but one team that's already managed to qualify, of course, is going to be Red Dragon. They got it done in three matches today, winning match point, and now we've got to find out who else is going to be joining them. We've got two more games to go, and uh, Storm Point, I would say, uh, that was a little bit of a, a quiet end zone, a straight 3v3 for it with the amount of space that was left. It was somewhat surprising to see uh, down on the southern side of the map. 
Yeah, everyone kind of just died the circle before when everyone was trying to force their way into that zone. I think it was the late arrivals were just causing a ruckus and the amount of damage that had been done to some of those teams, it was just an easy sweep up for those who had a more commanding position and a more kind of safeguard position as well. So it meant that there was just a few less teams in the circle, but I'm always down for seeing a 3v3. However, it was a 3v3 that kind of was one-sided because one team had a massive advantage in the position that they held, but it could have been changed by the Kraber and that's always the beauty of Apex Legends. It's just that one gun or that one play can make a difference if someone just pops off. Uh, sadly for the Apex Warlords, they could not do it in that game. However, they still get a good amount of points and find themselves pushing them into the top five now, which, of course, the magic number being the top eight with number one already been taken by Red Dragon. So two games to go. And one thing to kind of discuss, and I want to get your input on this as well, is if you're a Storm Point uh, favoriting team today, you're going to be maybe a little bit annoyed at Red Dragon because we've got six games and we're going two by two. So we're only going to get two games of Storm Point, if my math is correct, which is always a risk. It's always a risk. So we're going back over to World's, Ed World's Edge now. And if you are one of those teams who's probably looking at Storm Point as being your reliable map for points or whatever it might be, then you have to adjust and adjust quickly because there's two more games to go and it's just World's Edge. You're going to get just World's Edge to play. Well, one of the teams who was better on World's Edge was Danish, right? They were able to not only find a victory, but also a good points total in match number two. Then they struggled a little bit when it came to Storm Point. So now this is going to be their opportunity, you'd imagine, to try and pick up the pieces once more and demonstrate what they can do on World's Edge. Again, the same thing will happen, though. Just as what we saw on Storm Point, a POI has opened. So that is going to change everything. That's going to change the possibility of where you're rotating, where you're moving. Do you want to switch to a better POI? There is going to be someone in this lobby who has a bad POI that can say, all right, actually, let's give ourselves the best opportunity of getting to Pro League. Let's go to one of the better POIs. Let's go to where Red Dragon have just left uh, an open space for us and see if we can maybe make a difference from there. Got to be funny if someone went there, though, and two teams had the same idea. Ah, that can happen. I'm for. That's what I'm waiting for. See, I think that's... Uh... That's certainly something to look forward to. But I think it's a, a very smart idea, right? Just hovering that dropship a little bit. If you can, of course, if your current drop spot is miles away from where Red Dragon were dropping, then it's probably a bit too much of a risk to do so. But if you're, you know, in a flight path, in a flight distance, I should say, kind of accessible place to get to that POI, then then why not see if that you can make that work? Although your game plan, your macro might not be built around that, so it might be a little bit of an adaptation, but... You know, we'll have to see if that is going to be the case. But the fact that we go back to World's Edge now is, I think, like you mentioned, the biggest story here is, is great for Danish, right? They've looked pretty strong so far today. Storm Point quiet in comparison to their performance on World's Edge. But if a couple of zones go their way, like they did in the first two, then they could be solidifying their points as well. But I think it's time to start looking at maybe the cutoff point, right? Because there's a few teams who have put enough points on the board where you feel like it's going to be difficult for them to not qualify at this point. But that eighth place is going to be the cutoff. And if you're in ninth going into these final two games, then you're probably trying to think, hey, okay, we need to be consistent here. This is a, this is a great time to win a game. But I think you can take inspiration from what players have just done. They jumped what, like 12 positions up the leaderboard from 19th to potentially 4th or 5th when we get the confirmation of those standings. So they have demonstrated that if you can have one big game it could send you into Pro League. That might be enough for players now. Depending on what happens in these last two matches, that one game could have sent them to Pro League. So I think everyone needs to kind of take a page out of their book and say, all right, well, let's just put our best foot forward. Let's try and make sure we get it done in match number five and not leave it to match number six. I know that's easier said than done of let's just play a good game, but it can certainly happen. Well, one place, of course, you can watch it is right here. But of course, we also have Face It Watch available for you if you want to watch your team's favorite POV and catch up to four POVs at once as well. You've also got the map overhead there and you've got the beautiful little volume mix you can see in the bottom right of your screen there to make sure that your mix is perfect and catered to exactly how you want it. So head over to faceit.com forward slash watch if you want to choose that way to watch these games. Two more to go here. Back to World's Edge, Dan. And to be honest with you, I kind of want a central zone. I don't know why, I just want a central zone. I just want a proper monument central zone where everyone has to proper scrap it out in the end game to see if they can get a win. I, want, I don't want anyone gifted at this point. I'm feeling mean. I think you've got to work for it. He wants a brawl is what he would like to see. Well, we have two Western zones to begin with in World's Edge that 
played towards the likes of Danish, who were dropping over towards Mirage Artois and Lava Fissure. Although with the kind of zone shifts we saw in match number two, it didn't really help Danish. So maybe they would like to see a circle that moves a little bit differently for them this time, rather than something that they just have to bunker down and wait and hope that they're going to be able to hold on to that position for quite some time. As all the teams do begin to drop, and we look across to see if there is any fights, unlikely with an extra POI being available. Everyone should be friendly enough now. But this is crunch time. If you want to be in the Pro League next season, or next split, excuse me, you need to make sure that match number five and six are some of your better games. We're all quiet. We are going to the north, by the way, and the team on your screen right now are going to be very happy with that rolling team. So we've got a little bit of ring information. We can bring it to you as well. Apex Warlord's going to be a great spot, which is good news for them after their second place in the last game we just saw on Storm Point. But Climatizer is going to be the zone. And it's going to be interesting to see if it pulls to the backside of Climatizer towards where that little kind of uh, pylon building is, I would say, or sort of pylon structure outside of the main buildings of Climatizer, or if it does move a little bit more towards that northern building. But Apex Warlords, great spot for them. But rolling teams, this is a, a huge opportunity for them now. Do rolling teams have a ring console, though? That's my question. I, I mean, I can't see one at the moment for them, uh, which yeah. could be detrimental. Because if you only see ring one here, right, how good is your circle knowledge? How aware of you of where it's pulling? Sure, there's a slight shift and you could bank on it going north. But if rolling teams start to maybe think it could be potentially a train track beacon scenario, they might start moving a little bit further northwest and they could pull themselves out of the better spot. And that's why ring consoles sometimes are absolutely massive. But also your IGL, how well do they know ring ones? Yes, ring two can be a severe pull sometimes, but you can still notice patterns and you can still have have that memory to work off of yeah, it's, a, it's a tough one for rolling teams right because quite rightly like you say they have not got a, a ring console to know where the zone's going they also don't have a survey beacon and i'm pretty sure they don't really have any evo harvesters near them as well so it could be a case of hey we have god spot and then a team shoots them and they're like hey we have white armors like, just ignore that though like it's all good like just leave us alone because they will be run over if apex warlords go up to them now who have ring console and uh, survey beacon and they have a harvester on their way and see that they're in god spot with white armor Let's take the fight why would you not take the fight well you were talking about the cutoff point earlier eighth place is where the benchmark is and it is forbidden at the moment who hold said position so they're gonna be making their rotation through the train tunnel it seems like they've caught a wild player flying through the sky and they were able to get some free kp here that was a nice little pr gift from the heavens for sure that was. I mean, we were talking about how Red Dragon felt like they were probably gifted that game where they won everything, a match point, or one match point, I should say. That is about as close as you can get to a gift if you're a team just running on the tracks just to play a falling. Can't even bring his gun up because he's falling from the sky. And yeah, free, basically. Free as you can, as you like. Forbidden probably thinking about an evac here to see if they can get north a little bit quicker or they might be thinking about just wrapping all the way to the north here towards the train tracks. That's another opportunity, or should I say another potential end zone, of course, towards those train carts on the train tracks to the north of uh, survey between survey I should say and climatizer and we'll have, always wrapping from the north we would talk about wrapping to the north is probably the best way to play these zones because you have that rock coverage and when you're working from the south side through epicenter it's pretty rough to have to walk you know walk from monument in across the open ground up to the huge cliffside high ground whatever it might be it's just it's a tough rotate to make unless you got evac that one kill for Forbidden, by the way, put, put them up into seventh place. That's how close it is at the moment between seventh, eighth, and sixth. And Forbidden are moving in on Meow. Meow are in last position at the moment. They're in 20th place on eight points. So if you are Forbidden and you maybe get a, an inkling of the skins and what you're going up against and how much research you've done, you might know that it is a potentially easier fight than others. But if Meow were to fall, then certainly their chances of Pro League are starting to look less and less likely. Now, Danish, a team who should be securing their spot in Pro League with the position they find themselves in at the moment. They're on 40 points. They're in third place. That means they are, what, 20 points roughly ahead of the cutoff. That's a pretty good spot to be in. But if you have two back-to-back -back zero games, there's always that opportunity that you could fall drastically down that leaderboard. But I'd say that Danish are in a pretty good spot. Yeah, Danish are a good spot as well. And you can see they're not really trying to make their way towards zone too quickly. They don't really have a great rotate from lava fisher over to here anyway so they one good thing that they have on their side is the fact that they can hit a few beacons on their way and a survey beacon is i would say increased in value i believe from what it was before season 20 with the evo changes because of the fact that now with knowing with that scan where every single team is you can kind of plan 
what Evo harvesters you can get without being contested, how to work your way into the zone, and how to get your Evo up without having to take too many fights. So a smart play for them to go for that. Rolling teams are going to pick up a kill as well. 19 squads still remaining as we do lose yet another player, but rolling teams up to blue. So dropping here over a climatizer, getting up to blues is uh, not too bad for them, but a long way to go to purple. Yeah, there's a lot of on the on the fly decision making i'd say that some of these igls have to make and we do see some of the better teams be able to plan quickly and effectively on their rotations and uh, i do like the way it's changed things with the evo harvesters ever since they were introduced uh, this was meow that i was mentioning earlier in last place at the moment but if they would have a game like players did and get 20x points suddenly they find themselves in the top eight so it is doable here but if you find yourself having to do that in match number six, then you're going to be saying, okay, is it even possible? But right now, with two matches still remaining, it's certainly doable. Deadfish, ninth. So they are currently cut off. They wouldn't be qualifying for Pro League. They're on 23 points. They're only a few behind eight, though. Well, Forbidden are trying to collapse in on this at the moment. They're kind of playing the, uh, the other side of this sandwich. Uh, looking to not be too aggressive. Just trying to extend a little bit to get some damage on. Try and get a knock. But they are in Godspot at the moment, Forbidden. This is the, po the position that I was talking about. It does look like it's going to be pulling towards them a little bit as well. Right at the back on this rock formation and the little kind of concrete pylon that you will be able to see in a few moments' time. But the longer this fight takes and the slower these teams are forced to rotate in, the more likely it is if you're on edge of zone that you're going to be having someone come behind you. And OR9 are the team who are approaching Meow now who are trying to do that initial damage to dead fish and they look like they're about to collide with each other as well so meow by not being aggressive by not being able to take out dead fish and forcing that fight now they've got a problem yeah meow also let forbidden get past them by the way meow had the kind of race won when it comes to finding the, the themselves in the northern side but they allowed forbidden just to go over and now they are struggling they are down to just one and oh nine getting aggressive trying to push up on the advantage they've been able to get with the initial damage and it looks like they're going to pick up some kp they're in 10th right now so again only a few points behind top eight that one gill pushes them into ninth. it's going to be so close when we get down to that eighth place cut off in match number six on set it is going to be heartbreak for some of these teams oh my God. when we get into there but you can see that nez just went down as well by the way it should become absolute carnage that initial kill the initial fight that's went down is oh wow he opened up the northern side of the map or knight now taken down danish uh flanking in behind this and window cleaners and dead fish are still here forbidden still here and trust me meow have one alive and might be able to wrap back behind everything urgency are coming through the tunnel as well this is carnage this is going to be about three or four teams you drop in the next minute or so as this zone starts to close and i can't kind of reinstate enough that getting into top 15 and getting that one extra point could be everything for your chances of qualifying for pro league and if you have a dull, a dull game if you have a game where you know you're going to be struggling and you are just a one you need to be ratting out you need to try and be getting that extra point because it could make the difference as now danish they're up to second place on 43 points with the kills they were able to just find and over in overlook which is a little bit away from the action at the moment you can see trojan having a little look over towards call me data this fight probably for that survey beacon that you can see inside of Overlook. Both teams kind of just meeting on their rotate and their timing. Trojan have that high ground. Don't have the best of attachments at the moment. You can see on the Prowler, no mag, which could be a problem. He doesn't hit the initial shots. And also, you can see there's a big disparity in shields at the moment. Poison doing what he can to try and hold off this push, but the Caustic is already down. So now it wouldn't be a surprise to see another climb up and this fight end pretty quickly. Trojan, who are in third at the moment, will lose that fight. And that opens up the leaderboards a little bit more. Call me Dana will win the fight. They're in sixth at the moment. If they pick up a more, few more kills and a few more placements, then you could see that increase as well. Yeah, it was a bigger fight for Call me Dada over Trojan because Trojan are in a more comfortable position with their points total. But Call me Dada now in sixth place. Again, this is uh, going to be very tight. But that fight... I think it's good that they did push it using the Horizon Grav Lift just to get some height and maybe surprise Trojan who were probably thinking they were going to be the ones to engage from above, but the armor difference really did make everything. Uh, in 18th spot right now, Free Sosa making their rotation in, but sadly they have lost a player, but maybe they can get him back. We should go there. And it looks like they're going to try and get him back. So here we go. Free Sosa still keeping their hopes of Pro League alive. Leave a harvester in front of them as well. Probably just waiting a few seconds until Sat lands on the floor before popping this make sure that he gets the evo as well last thing you want to do is steal that away from him be a bit actually that's something i'd do <laughs> i'd respawn you i think it's something you have done out of it. i'll be i'll be like, i've got purple and you'll be like cool cool i'm, <laughs> I don't, yeah. I'm still on gray four thousand away from blue 
Okay, cool. Even though it's impossible, but you know. Oh, this is a good push from SPS, just to really hunk it down in the middle, but oh, they don't get the time to even set up. It's rolling teams who have been holding Climatizer this entire game, and they are not letting anyone push in for free. I like this. I like the amount of space that rolling teams are commanding right now. It's the entirety of the building, and as soon as anyone lands, they are straight out. They are, like, lurking in the shadows right now, waiting for anyone to drop, making them think it's safe, and then they join in the fight. Urgency trying to back, well, I should say, urgency finding themselves probably surrounded by more death boxes that makes them comfortable at the moment because this is where half the fights in the lobby seem to have gone down on the northern side of this zone. And there's going to be some more in just a second, but oh my word, great response with some shots. And it's Danish again who are just holding this side and to be honest, farming this side as well. They've got the gold knock as well, which is going to get them back on their feet with a little bit of health to play with as well. Sherbert will be back on his feet and urgency eliminated. And once again, Danish say, hey, everybody needs to learn a lesson here this is our side of the zone yeah you've got danish you've got forbidden they are both just holding the northern side at the moment and making it so difficult for these late rotators that are trying to arrive from any direction uh, on the southern side call me data who we saw win that fight earlier against trojan are still surviving they're in the red but they're coming up to npc now remember npc one of our challenger circuit winners in this lobby are they going to be able to get themselves into Pro League would be the big question. And it looks like they are winning the engagement at the moment. But still, a last-ditch attempt from Horizon here. It's good damage with the Hemlock, but has to turn around and reload. Incredible damage coming in. But unfortunately, just too many bodies for him to have to deal with. The zone is also closing as well. So, NPC, even though they win that fight, now they're going to be in trouble. Because the zone is closing behind them. You can see they've barely got any health themselves. Robin chooses to pop the bat instead of a med kit. You have no idea if he had white meds or not, but that's always a little bit of a risk to go for the uh, the bat. It's almost like muscle memory to go for it when you're in those fights and in those situations. But with the zone closing behind you, that can chip away at the health and you can find yourself on your back. But it did put NPC up into 10th position with that. But Danish, who have been dominating the lobby so far, let's jump into a listen and see what the comms are like. I mean, you need to smoke the cross. Trevor's dead, bro. I'm dead. Sophie, Bro, oh, are you fucking kidding me? Nice, bad, nice. Bang, bring, 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 bring down. Bang, bang down alone here. Yeah, I'm smoking three. Another card, I ulted it. I ulted yeah, it. Yeah, put. Yeah. A slide, slide under, slide under. Above, he's on the other side. He's flash, he's flash. Inside. I'm in. Back down, back down! Cossack one, Cossack one! One, one! Oh, one Hong Kong! On you, behind you! Behind you! Oh, no. Bro, how do you oh, kill him? One, bro, he's 17 flesh? No, 17 yes. shield? No, he swapped. Well, there's a comment there that I recognize myself, which is how did you not kill him? It's something that I ask of my teammates quite a lot because it's never my fault when we would lose a fight. MPC, though, on top of the building right now. And this is all the teams who are going to find it rough in the next few moments, Dan. 30 seconds until that zone starts to close and all of them have to slide in the open down that hill. Yeah, that was a difficult fight. It was a merry jig where Caustic was just going one way, he was going the other. Just couldn't get that final bit of damage. And sadly for him... It means they're Danish four, but they've done a lot of work in this lobby and they still find themselves in second place. But that means things open up for those teams who are competing for top eight right now. Both Apex Warlords and APC, but it's the Warlords who get the initial damage and the initial knock. Yeah, it's really, really impressive from them. They were inside of the building trying to hold it off and now they should be able to win this fight and it looks like they will be able to. It's a 2v1, I believe, still in and around this building. Shiv's taking his time to just pop a battery inside. They might be able to get that banner back, but with 45 seconds left, the question is, are they going to be able to win this fight? More more damage coming in here from Zerifa. She was looking to chase it down to finally finish this one off. It's a little bit messy. It's a little bit scrappy, but finally they should get it done. You would imagine an NPC will go down. Now, is there a mobile res about? Can they get him back in the game here? The Corsic in the end game, so, so vital. But the problem is the zone's going to force their hand. Zeri was holding on to a scan for that entire fight, and I was just desperate for him to pop it, but now it works out. Now you've got a scan to go in. Maybe he just was convinced they were going to win that engagement, so didn't even worry about hitting the scan. Now, rolling teams, 14th place, 20 points, but not too far away from that cutoff and still with an opportunity because the circle has come to them. They've been here right since the start of the game. They dropped here over towards Climatizer, and now they have plenty of room to work with as the Warlords down to two, but here is what you were talking about. They can deliver the banner to the beacon. They might be able to get back up to a full three. Banner to the beacon. Sounds like banner a, to the beacon. 
popular second album from your local indie band. Atlas eliminated in the meantime, seven squads remaining, and a Kraber again for Zeri. Now, he did some good work with it previously as we take a look at the zone. Hopefully, we get back to that point of view ASAP as there's an opportunity for him to hit some damage onto rolling teams inside of that building who have been so good at holding it down. But well, one Kraber shot can be the difference. We saw the end game in that previous game where Apex Warlords couldn't quite connect with that one shot that maybe would have put them into first instead of second. Well, now they have the chance to put that right kneecap inside a zone as Genji falls back down with a soft landing. And the Warlords are back to full health, back to a full three. Now, speaking of the climatizer drop and speaking of the likes of rolling teams who have been holding it for so long, is that going to be to their detriment? It looks like they're going to be making a move to try and get into a position on the northern side soon, but we've already got the likes of Kneecap and the likes of Forbidden who have taken some of these outer areas that might be a real threat for the chances of rolling teams of winning this one. But Apex Warlords and DN all have to move from the southern side, as well do players, by the way, who have just been hiding and waiting in the distance to make their move. So there's going to be three teams all moving from the south at the same time. Well, the one thing here that you'll probably notice is everyone has somewhere to play because there's only six teams alive with the zone still closing. So everyone is going to be pretty good for, you know, being able to single out fights and reset if they do take some damage until the final moments where the zone forces their hand. It's not a case of everybody kind of coexist coexisting next to each other with a lot of teams still alive in the lobby where no one can afford to peek and push because it means another angle is going to open up for a team. It's a case of finding your spot here, taking an opportunity at 3v3 if you can isolate it and just surviving that way. For now, though, Apex Warlords are safe, but can they find a place to play? Players eliminated in the meantime, and Zeri has got to knock himself. Yeah, the Warlords have to push just slightly north from where they currently reside. The Kraber could make a big difference, but now the ults are starting to come in. This is where your vision starts to get a little bit skewed, and you've just got to try and do your best to stay alive, and it looks like it's going to be downhill from here for the Warlords. They've already lost one, and it might be more, because it's rolling teams who are there and waiting, as they have been throughout the entire game here, looking to try and make sure Climatizer is there their zone to win. They're on 24 points at the moment. They are catching the leading pack. They need a win here. It's a 3v3v3 here in the end game as well. And you can see the team who's on the northern side, Kneecap, I believe. Are the Excuse me, it's not Kneecap. I think it's Forbidden, the only team who have one red Evo armor. Everyone else in the lobby is on purple. So the HP is pretty equal between everyone at the moment. But it looks like Forbidden and Rolling Teams are the two teams who are closest to each other who will be forced to engage. Kneecap have to pick their moment here. They have a port down, but does that port put them in a position where they can clean up damage? I remember, Forbidden were in eighth when they started this game. However, Kneecap and rolling teams were both outside of the top eight. So this is a huge match for all three of these teams, but maybe more so for the likes of kneecap and rolling teams if they can find a victory. For Forbidden, they're up to fifth place at the moment. Again, 39 points is a pretty good total when we look at a top eight cutoff, but they'll want to make sure they're even more comfortable with a few more as now round six will begin to close. Difficult to navigate 3v3v3 sometimes. You have to try and be the last team to enter as we know, but sometimes you're forced into these fights by the other teams depending on what ultimate and what abilities are available for their legends. Really smart decision there from Forbidden, by the way. They took themselves out of the position where they were going to be forced to engage and moved into the center of zone on this rock formation. Now it's a case of kneecap and rolling teams having to move first. They can hold this spot. They can back up. They can take their time as both teams will do damage to each other. This might be their opportunity to close out here. They do have a Wraith to kneecap, so something's a little bit different in terms of their composition. They could go for a portal to try and go for a little bit of a flanking play, but of course, when you go for that portal, you do potentially become very vulnerable and somewhat targeted, as now kneecap are going to make their move, and sadly, they have been spotted out, and they're going to do this initial damage. Yeah, this is going to just open the door for Forbidden to move in. This was what the brilliance of the previous move was. It was about doing something that didn't involve shooting your gun. Kneecap down to just one, and it should be a case of moving in for Forbidden. That game was one about 30 seconds ago without them even firing a shot. The position they took ahead of the other two teams made that simple. I'd argue that Forbidden won that game 10 minutes ago, maybe even 20 minutes ago, right at the start when we saw them rotating through the train tunnel and they were able to get ahead of Meow and take the northern side of Climatizer right at the beginning of the game. They were able to get ahead of five or six teams. They were all trying to do the same thing. And while all that, all that commotion was happening on the kind of north side where Danish were killing all those teams coming from the tunnel, Forbidden were just a little bit further, just kind of overwatching everything, adding a little bit of damage here or there, but knowing they were in one of the prime positions for the end game and they were able to get there but as you then mentioned it was just delicately placing themselves in that final circle to ensure that they were the last team to enter the fight
I thought you were going to say it was it was one ten minutes ago in the pre-chat lobby, which I've seen a lot of games <laughs> won and lost in. Let me tell you, and I'm I'm almost like guy. There isn't a compilation of best pre-game lobby chats. In fact, there's a content idea for you. I think that's a very good one. Best of the pre-game lobby. Although I chat. will say, be on your best behavior if your players. If that is going to be a content piece, because I've seen some interesting things be said in that pre-game lobby where they think maybe it's not being watched. Yeah, I, I've seen some words I don't know the meaning of in that pre-game <laughs> lobby. So uh, that's yeah, just because you're a boomer. Wow, you're just as old as me, fellas. <laughs> I know, just, I am too. You're just throwing yourself under a bus. That's true. <laughs> uh, one more game to go, though, and I think the the thing that you were highlighting really well in that last game is just how close that cutoff is, right? One game for any of these teams at this point can really change how this leaderboard looks. You could be sat in sixth at the moment thinking, hey, guys, we're sixth going into this final game, one more game on World's Edge, just keep it simple, keep it solid. You fall early, and all of a sudden you're preying on the downfall of others because this lobby could completely change. I would say outside of maybe... The top five, top four, even if you're you, you're looking at it and you're going, this could not be as comfortable as we think it is. We could be very disappointed when it comes to the end of this game. Yeah, I think if you're one of those teams who is fighting for the top eight, that's in like I don't know sixth to sixteenth right now, yeah. you're hoping that the likes of Trojan or Danish absolutely destroys this lobby and just gobbles up those points if you are in the top six to eight if you are one of the teams that's a little bit lower you're like okay well how do we make sure we get those points and knock out some of these teams so there's a very different play style that's potentially going to happen here in match number six uh but you know a lot of teams are going to be worried and they're going to be actually terrified if they are around seventh to eighth right now because as you mentioned just one bad game and you won't be in pro league yeah, it's, it's very scary moments and i think for the teams who come out of that drop ship and land they're kind of just give us the zone. Just please, like, let's make this as easy as possible. And it's the last thing you want. Imagine you're in eighth spot at this point. And you're on World's Edge, right? And you're dropping over at Climatizer. And it's like, okay, tree zone. And you're like, mm. really? Really going to make me work that hard for it? Like, I mean, I will say, like I said previously, I think there is some advantages now to working your way from edge and kind of having to play away from zone with the way you can path for Evo. But it's it's still going to be fun to watch if that is going to be the case for some of these teams. Someone's not going to be close to zone. That's what we know, who, who's going to get into uh, one of these final spots. But the fact that we are so close at this point, Dan, and all these teams know that you know, this has been days of playing now in this PLQ to get to this point, to come to one game and with one game remaining and not make it, or on the other side to make it, that's what it's all about, right? And this is going to be one of the exciting things about the fact that match point was already won in match number three. So we know it's definitely going to finish here in match number six. Usually, you know, we're done after what, eight or nine games. And then people have to work out, is the game going to finish here? Like, yes, we're in eighth right now, but the game might not finish. There might be another game to play. Is this team going to win on match point? Now the teams know that it is going to be completed here in match number six. So if you can get to X amount of a points total, you are going to be feeling safe. You are going to be feeling comfortable. It's not something we see very often. We don't really see match point one before six. So this is going to be quite exciting to see which of the teams are going to make it into the top eight and make it into the pro league. I normally ask you for predictions, but I'm actually feeling pretty. I'm feeling in a good mood today, so I'm not going to do that to you because I think it's very harsh, especially with uh, how many teams are still in contention. And you know, if you're in the chat right now, let us know who you think is going to go through. Let us know who you're supporting and you want to see go through and be a part of Split Two and part of the Amir Pro League because I think for, there's been some great stories of teams coming through challenges, coming through the PLQ, making it into Pro League, and then. You know, making that next step because that's part of the process, right? It's it's one thing to get into Pro League, but once you're there, you want to make it to LAN. And LAN, of course, is just around the corner in a few weeks, which we're very excited about. But we've got one more game to get through in Amir before we get to talk about that anymore. We're going to go for a quick break. When we get back, we'll have that game for you. Don't go anywhere.
everybody. Welcome back to the PLQ, where things have been insane here in EMEA all day for Apex Legends. Vicky, we've got one more game left because if you're just joining us, somehow Red Dragon made history, hits match point in two, closes it out in three. So that left us with three more matches for our teams to fight tooth and nail to get some points on the board to see who's going to be participating in split number two. It's been a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I've had to clean my eyes a little bit, scratch my eyes, because I, I still can't believe that Red Dragon not only reached match point after two games, but then took the back-to-back -back and won match point after the third game. But still, seven other spots that these teams are vying for right now. And I would like to say, I know Mark and Dan in the back were talking about when they predicted Forbidden was guaranteed to win. I will say that Forbidden knew that they had to take that dump because they were the only team after the last remaining three squads left in that final game to be in that top eight spot so they're trying to be comfy because we still have one more game to go glitter yeah absolutely and we knew that it was going to be an important final three matches we'll take a look at those match five results now and see how uh, some of our teams did obviously players coming through with 15 kills for a total of 27 points and as these teams start to heat up here i mean nine going the way of dead fish it's starting to change the standings as we knew them vicky yeah, this was huge. Huge game here for players because they were on the bottom end of the leaderboard. I think they were 19th before this game and then coming in with a dub and 15 KP, that was absolutely huge. Even looking at Apex Warlords, who are another team that's within the top eight, and then looking at Deadfish with the 9 KP. This was game number four, by the way, our Echo HQ final zone, which is very explosive. Yeah, good, good catch there, Vicky, as well. Uh, and we'll continue looking through at some of the rest of these numbers. Obviously, some of our teams struggling a little bit, and that's really uh, affecting where they need to go. And we talked about this because as soon as that match point was hit, it instantly limited the amount of time some of these squads had to get those points on the board. So when you see these performances out of these teams that have the 15 KP, the 19 KP, it really is massive for getting themselves in those top spots. Like we've mentioned, Red Dragon took one of the eight available spots for split two. So that means there's only seven left and now only one more opportunity to try and get themselves in those top seven. Absolutely. This is the second page of that game four too, but it is nice to highlight after our last game, game number five with Forbidden winning with 10 KP. That was a climatizer end zone and we could see how so many other teams were falling, playing by the edge of that circle, trying to figure out that rotate into that climatizer side. Especially if you're going from the train track side, I feel like there's little to no cover to really work with there. So the squads that were able to settle up in climatizer usually see a heavy end zone because there's so much space to coexist in. Yeah, so now we'll have to see, though, will we start to get some of that, uh, some more, I guess, of that anticipated PLQ chaos? Will teams try to do something here in that last-ditch attempt to, if they're right on that bubble, put themselves up just those few extra points that they need to be? We've seen too many times throughout all all of ALGS competition, just how much every single KP matters, just how much every placement point matters. Sometimes it really is a difference of one kill here or there that determines whether or not teams are qualifying for whatever it is they're trying to qualify for that game. Absolutely. I mean, there's only eight slots here to participate in the Split 2 Pro League. Once again, to those of you guys tuning in just now, we've already crowned a match point winner. It's going to be Red Dragon, but we are fighting off for the remaining seven slots for these teams to compete, not in LAN, but to compete for a Pro League Split 2. Time is of the essence here as we get to see more of these teams fight it out to see where they're going to be standing in the top eight alongside Red Dragon. Trojan still up there, Danish as well, but can they stay consistent for this final game? You know, we heard, uh, we heard you guys talking about it in the last couple matches as well. Apex Warlords, another squad we're definitely keeping our eyes on, seeing if they are able to solidify those top spots. Because, like, I think it was Dan who said it, if I'm not mistaken, it just wouldn't be Pro League without a shiv in it. So, I mean, there's we've got lots that we have to be paying attention to. And one more opportunity to do it. It's the last match, which means we also have switched it up on them one more time here. I want... I'm glad that we're closing things out here on World's Edge. Switched out for the third time, I guess, since this last two matches. But I think from what we've seen all day for the performances on World's Edge, we're seeing lots of pop-off moments from the teams that need it 
on World's Edge. They were a little bit slower on Storm Point. So this is an opportunity for the likes of, you mentioned Trojan being at the top. We saw a good performance out of Danish to kick off the day on World's Edge as well. This is an opportunity for them to really get those points. Yeah, especially for the teams that feel that confidence, feel way stronger on World's Edge, where it works into these compositions that we've been exposed to since the very beginning of the split, I would say. Looking at Atlas, they're rocking that same legend composition. I'm thinking of the Bangalore, Bloodhound, and the Caustic. A lot of buildings exist in with the Caustic to try to take over that space here on World's Edge. And now seeing how this is going to work out into the teams that do find that success here on this map versus what they have to deal with on Storm Point. Vicky, did you did you say you wanted a specific zone in a specific area or or no? I I was dreading the Echo HQ zones, but it looks like you know these northern zones on World's Edge just happen to really like me too. But <laughs> on the plus side, Lord, it is not gonna be a climatizer zone. This is gonna be pulling more so in between Epi and maybe even I'm thinking the train tracks over to the left side. We'll see if it continues to try to pull north. But we've seen some pretty uh, heavily whiplash circle pulls within the last season. <laughs> And so we'll see how this works out, especially for Apex Warlords, the team that we keep talking about for all the right reasons. You mentioned that Dan earlier had said that it'd be very strange to see a pro league without Shiv. This is the team that has been trying to put in the numbers and they've been rather consistent, but they haven't found themselves within that dub just yet. This may be it for them since this is their POI advantage that they land between Epi and Survey. Yeah, not only that, but it could give them an opportunity to clear out rolling teams behind them and really own that northeastern corner of this zone and kind of give themselves a little bit of breathing room to work with. Meanwhile, we're looking at SPS and they are going up against Deadfish over in Landslide right now. Those Rampart walls proving to be very useful, but also deciding that this is the last match. Do you really want to take an early engagement in somewhere as open as Landslide for the potential for these other teams to come through? Maybe from Countdown or Love of Fisher and get some third party. No, neither of them want to be dealing with that. So they decide to back off, play this a little bit safer and live to see another day. And this opens things up to talk about the different play styles that these teams that are on the cusp that could have that one really good game, the way that they're going to start shifting their play style into a much more passive aggressive one. They want to take control over that circle, get into a way better position, but without ignoring these evil harvesters that teams could be camping by too. Because if you're going to be playing a lot more passive for this final game to make sure that you could get within that top eight spot that qualified pro league for split two, then you have to make sure that you're entering these final zones without just a blue evo shield but at least a purple to red and right, we had a little bit of a top down there we saw that apex warlords are nice and cozy finding themselves a building to holes for now as they wait for the circles to shrink meanwhile window cleaners battling their way through skyhook trying to maybe get some poke damage get some evo set up for themselves here potentially going up against or9 i think meow is up there as well so there's quite a few squads in this area that could see some action here in the next few minutes okay, with more teams making their appearance window cleaners taking some shots at the team trying to exit out of the vault tunnel but they pop piece of the hunt a little early not trying to entry frag just yet, but trying to get information with the scan. Black Hole is going to be called in too from the squad that had the height here. And still taking their time for this fight with knowing that there's another team in the distance. It's just going to be the green light for a third party to inevitably come in once they see that there's knocks are going to be going out. Window cleaners doing a good job, at least playing this safe. Also able to do some poke damage from this roof as they catch one of those teams out on rotation. Frick's going down in the kill feed. Window cleaner deciding to drop down and see if they can clean this one up. And Meow does go down. That was that third squad in the area. And that was huge for window cleaners. Yeah, but now this is going to be OR9 moving forward to see if they can take advantage of window cleaners. who Just finished up that fight that we saw underneath Sky. Forbidden, the team that just won game number five are now down to a duo. This is the squad that were taking some shots at the Skyhook teams. But look who's waiting for them on the other side of the mouth for the vault tunnel. It is Danish, who had taken that one player away from Forbidden. So now seeing Danish, they're going to be on the edge of the circle for where that circle is going to be pulling to. Yeah, definitely a really good opportunity for Danish to do a little gatekeeping there as we check back in with OR9, seeing how they're handling this battle with window cleaners still up in Skyhook, but also it's been going on for so long. Definitely an opportunity for Forbidden to come in and try in third party as there's been lots of commotion in this general vicinity, and I think that's exactly what they're going to do. We get a little bit of a peek here. We can see now third squad is involved. 
and they called in their third as well. Aku, make your way in from Forbidden. This was crucial. I have to highlight because Forbidden is in the third place spot for this top eight, but it's not by a lot if you consider how tight this top eight is in general. Data's right behind them by one point. And Window Cleaners, the team that really does need to go all out for this game, they're sitting in 16th. And this is their final chance opportunity as Urgency involved in a fight. It's only left to two. Now leave it down to one solo playing off the second floor of this building. The Gravity Lift, are you just going to dip in this case here? I mean, of Urgent Matters here, you're just sliding around. You're getting hit from the high ground. The Gravity Lift was pulled up and Urgency get eliminated in 18th it is npc that take advantage of that fight definitely a rough spot for urgency to be in there npc doing a really nice job handling that engagement but also knowing that there was a, another team in the general vicinity i believe it was shimani but they decided to back off away npc and give them that monument area as they continue their rotation into the next circle and we can see that here as we now get a top-down look of that map you can see that window cleaners or9 still going at it in skyhook but forbidden having decided to back away danish now holding that western edge of the circle could potentially Potentially gatekeep forbidden but lots of squads finding themselves in much earlier back and forths right now as everyone has to make pretty long rotations to get into the circle Sometimes for these final games, knowing where everybody's settled in the overall standings and where it really matters the most, you gotta try to go and grief some of these teams that may be cutting you off on your rotate. OR9 who have moved up now, coexisting on the high ground, right here by window cleaners who we're able to take care of Mal that we saw earlier. We hear an evac tower in the distance. It looks like they're calling one of their own, too. The scan, though, up from above, just trying to see where they're positioned before they decide to either take that. But that would just be a death sentence at that point. It seems as if OR9 is like, hey, come in. The water's all fine here. But they're <laughs> definitely not going to be taking that. They are definitely trying to wait out each other no one wanting to make the first move like you were talking about vicky this will be a little bit of a stalemate but they only have so much time before the zone will make the decision for them and they need to take into consideration which they don't know for certain but they are definitely going to assume there's at least one team waiting for them right on the edge of the safe area and that'll be danish trying to see anyone coming in from skyhook but people who might not be so safe we're now checking in with free sosa who has at least one squad in their sights the frags and arc stars are coming out trying to get some information with that bloodhound as well and see if they can maybe put in some work here underneath that bridge the flat land in hand, though. Sad is trying to take some shots at Kami Data, who's about to get pinched, by the way. Dead Fish is on the other side from where Free Sosa is. And Free Sosa moving back. Don't want to be caught here. Talk about third parties, though. Moving in to finally engage on the fight happening in Skyhook while Danish is just sitting pretty. It's OR9 versus Window Cleaner. OR9, though, they trade knock for knock. Now we have one player left here for OR9. You see the pings coming out. It's going to be a 1v1 potentially here if he can get out through these doors. He doesn't want to get the reset fully here, but he pushes in. He He's one, he gets beamed. The slight high ground, leaving him one. Window cleaners come out on top. Can they get the reset is the question, because look at this, young Hong Kong is done waiting. No. The rest of Danish said, come in. We knew that you guys were still fighting. Free KP. This is a perfect opportunity for Danish to not only clear another team out of the lobby, but also own the western side of this zone. Like you said, free KP, window cleaners now out. And that other fight we saw going on earlier, it's for, it's Call Me Data that goes down to free Sosa. They look like they actually don't even take that much punishment for it. Only one knocked and able to get an easy reset here. I believe it was Deadfish that was also in the general vicinity considering going for that third party. It looks like they've backed off, giving free Sosa a lot of loot, but waiting for them right on the edge of the circle to see what happens when they start to make that push inside danish now on skyhook will have a little bit of a free rotation in there we'll have to see what happens on that southern side with free sosa and dead fish as now dead fish can start to see the trio moving in did danish clear that side though glitter we have to wonder they did give up that edge of the circle space by grandma's house maybe another team could have moved up we're gonna have to see as we see the action continue on over by Fragment. Dead Fish in the middle of the train tracks here though. They're suppressing Free Sosa who are rotating from outside the circle. But they, it's because they want that survey beacon information. And while they do claim this space, they're denying this information from slow rotating teams like Free Sosa who may now be playing this out as a duo as it seems.
Yeah, it, they're definitely now down, but at least it gives them a little bit more time to make a wider rotate safely because you can see that that eastern side is pretty open, so they might be able to continue through, maybe even go for the respawn beacon that's going to be close to that pathing that they'll have there. Meanwhile, you mentioned it, Vicky. Danish cleared out Skyhook, but it was NPC who moved in to where Danish was holding. Somehow, they're able to make their way out through the train tracks. NPC does not punish them enough, and Danish now all on purple, looted up, and moving into a safe position in the next circle. I can't believe they got away with that. I can't believe they wrote... The smoke nades are just so strong. They literally were so low originally, we're still able with the health disadvantage to rotate quickly into a building and survey camp and get away from MPC, who could have been the nail in the coffin for Danish, but not this case. Danish will be able to see another day as MPC wait in the distance, hearing dead fish and Shamani coming in. As you see Grandma's house getting contested, they are going to be able to move back, and Danish may be looking to re-engage in the distance. Yeah, you know, we're seeing lots of mobility out of Deadfish. They were southeast trying to go after Free Sosa. They heard some action on the western edge. They swing up there and try to see if they can get some KP on the board. They know this is their last opportunity. Meanwhile, Shimani going down in that kill feed in Deadfish, looking to see if they can clean up any of this loot and continue pushing in. Like you said, it's Danish that's going to be up in that area. NPC will also be around there as they were the team that was fighting Danish. So now this could be a little bit of a cluster here on the western side as there's teams that have been even farther in the circle that have been been waiting for these fights to break out to see if they can look the third party. Fighting here always makes me so uncomfortable, but there's an evil harvester right next to Danish, so it is expected for more of these teams who slow rotate with blue evos to try to fight for that exact spot. Now Danish is trying to prevent them from moving in with the circle closing in right behind their backs. Danish is taking care of Deadfish, literally putting them in a barrel, and Deadfish get eliminated, but overextending a little bit, also losing out on their Bloodhound. There's another squad in the distance. It's going to be Trojan now moving in to try to third party them before they can fully reset. Definitely a huge opportunity for Trojan here. Danish did a good job getting some of their shields off, but Trojan are very healthy and one on red with that Evo 8 in the hands of Antonym. Have to see if they're able to close this out. Now Trojan just looking very strong. The Beast of the Hunt giving all the information they need. The shield cracks coming through, and Trojan are moments away from taking out Danish, but somehow Danish are still surviving. These smokes are giving them all the cover that they need. That one solo of Danish, left so fast is now back in survey camp before they are forced to rotate with this circle closing in slowly see and i'm now going to be able to take some shots from the distance here and more of these squads kind of existing on the high ground all together with more teams on the low ground of epicenter though but it's atlas shooting at free sosa who not only was able to get their third back from the live probably by no name but now is rotating from that south side alongside players and we mentioned that Free Sosa would have that respawn, respawn beacon available to them on their pathing heading through to the next area, but now they've just run into so many other teams right now that it's rough. They're down to two. Another gets knocked. Atlas, though, also down to a solo player. This is just down to 1v1. But speaking of player, I believe players is in the wings waiting to see if they can third party this back and forth. Now gonna be able to move in onto Trojan as Atlas has just a solo tries to stay alive, but for how long? Literally no shield, one shot. Atlas get eliminated in 10th. Nine squads left, and the team's still fighting on the high ground right here. Players looking at Trojan, Free Sosa on the other side, trying to prevent them from moving in. Looks like there's a solo on the other side of the high ground of Epi, while the building right to the north of Epi is being fought on by Apex Warlords and Forbidden. We were wondering what was going to happen in this northern side of the zone. We knew eventually these teams are going to have to collapse. Apex Warlords now having to hold off Forbidden as they try to make a move inside the building. Forbidden taking a lot of damage for it. Those caustic barrels doing so much work. And right now, Apex Warlords are oh. still alive. Down to one. Those there for trying to keep the hopes and dreams alive. Oh, but the third party came oh. in at the perfect time. It was rolling teams that was waiting patiently for the engagement to happen. And now they clean up Apex Warlords and they finish off the last remaining squad forbidden in that building. Five squads left and the patience pays off here for rolling teams.
We literally talked about rolling teams at the very beginning, saying they were the only squad on the north side with Apex Warlords that they needed to worry about. They let them live for too long and are now punished for it as we check in with Kneecap, who are also in a really rough spot just down to Funk, who's trying to stay alive for the team right now. They were going up against Trojan, who's done a really good job of owning the space and taking everybody out. Kneecap down to the solo, Trojan Ojin owning that space, but rolling teams looking to try and make a move in now. Look at this the next circle. Look at where it's pulling to. It's going to be pulling away from rolling teams, and they're getting absolutely rolled by the bullets flying behind their heads right through Epi. That's Trojan, but they probably are not going to overextend. They're not going to give up their space because Trojan's inside the circle, unlike rolling teams. So Trojan's going to keep gatekeeping them. And we need to realize just how close these standings are becoming. Rolling teams are one of the squads that was in that bubble area trying to stay alive to get these last few points and secure a top eight spot so they can make their way to split two. Out before the storm as the smoke provides the extra leftover cover that they need. Looks like one member of Trojan is just trying to get at a different off angle. Doesn't want to expose too much, but there's just little to no cover on this rotate. Looking at rolling teams and the space that they are about to cover right now with the circle closing in right behind their backs. A lot of these teams trying to wait each other out and see if they can maybe live to see another day. SPS. Once again, using these, we've seen these rampart walls being very useful for our teams here. SPS really doing a great job going to either side of this cover and dealing some poke damage, being very, very annoying right now. Managing to live, and no one's really punishing them for it. Going up against DN, he's still got Trojan and rolling teams on the outside kind of worrying about each other, so this is an opportunity for SPS to really make a move. I love how they're rotating between each rampart wall when the Beast of a Hunt was down here too, but here comes rolling teams sliding down from the high ground, closing in that gap, managing to survive the pressure from Trojan and now wrapping around the remaining teams here, but they've essentially sandwiched themselves. Trojan's gonna be right behind them while they try to engage on this rampart team. SPS now engaging on DN. SPS get eliminated and DN only a solo left as rolling teams move forward. We also still have a solo alive on Kneecap, who was in the top seven heading into this. So they're doing a good job ratting out for some more points as rolling teams continue to make their push in, taking out DN. It's now down to three on rolling teams, and that solo on Kneecap just might have been enough for rolling teams to secure top eight. This was huge for them. Before this game, they were intent, and they take the final game. The solo served on the silver platter of some free KP, and rolling teams are your game six winners. Really, really strong performance there for rolling teams. I feel like not being challenged early game, Vicky, when they were mostly just in the vicinity of Apex Warlords, that allowed them so much space and time to slow play that northern edge, to push through those teams. They took really smart engagements and they backed off when they needed to. They knew they were on the bubble, like you said, in 10th place heading into this match. Will that be enough to get them into top eight? And that's why they were waiting patiently when they saw other teams engaging. When they saw Apex Warlords engage with Forbidden, it was unfortunate for Apex Warlords because they were the ones that had control over that building. But the moment that fight broke out, there was nobody guarding that south side doorway. That was just free pickings for the teams to just move in and not only take that free KP, but then take control over that northern position that you had mentioned. The only team that was harassing them was Trojan. And then once mm. Trojan was split up and they had to look to their south side because there was two other teams moving into their position there was nothing that they could have done they essentially split their attention and that cost them the game right there yeah it was a really good job of some of our bubble squads pushing or making that final push here as that was the last match of plq for amia but i want to get gaskin back in here and get his thoughts on what we saw go down in match number six uh talk to me a little bit about what you took away from that uh, the Italians showing their greatness, the rolling teams guaranteeing their spot into Pro League. I mean, it was looking like it could have been pretty dire for them coming in at 10th place. They were kind of waiting for a few of those squads ahead of them to maybe get knocked out, but then to come in with a victory at the end, you need that kind of presence if you are going to be competing in the Pro League. And I think that rolling teams have showed that from Challenger to Pro League, they are going to be a real threat in the lobby in Pro League. Yeah, I think we've seen... Uh, in general today, just some really standout performances from our squads trying to make their way into split two, proving 
why they should be in the conversation for that next portion of our season, for that next level of competition, especially when you factor in the other teams that we had high expectations of, life or like Red Dragon, like Danish, and like a few other teams that we've already mentioned throughout the broadcast. Before uh, we continue talking about, though, let's go back to those final circles. We'll go all the way back to game number four and talk through some of these final moments. Uh, Vicky, you were able to cast this first one, so I want I want you to remind everybody of what went down here. Uh, the curse of the e Echo HQ final zones. My favorite to always cover, but it was players who were absolutely frying from the middle portion of the game to even the very end. That's why they were able to contest this final circle with full red Evos, because it was just nonstop fighting for this team. Aside from that, they were able to rotate and time that rotate perfectly to get into this posi position nice. And with them having the high ground here, they were able to have not only the positioning advantage, but then continuously pressure this team stuck behind that one rock. Yeah, and this is that match that we were talking about when we came back from the break as well. A game where players were able to put up 15 kills. I mean, a huge performance when they needed it because they had struggled in the previous three rounds. But then heading into match number five, Dan, tell me what happened in this final circle. Yeah, match five was when it started to get interesting for the overall standings. We were wondering kind of who is going to step up and who's going to struggle. You had a few teams who really needed a victory in this one. And you were thinking the likes of Nika who were in ninth position were they going to be able to find something was the wraith maybe going to be the big difference for them to be able to escape but ultimately they were just being held out the entire time it was forbidden who had made the move to secure themselves a spot behind the pillar so that they could force these two teams together and then be the last team to engage and so often it happens that way with apex legends being a three versus three versus three you want to be that last team to engage you want to try and force them together but it's about making the play early to try and gain that position so you can do so and forbidden did just that. Yeah, and both Forbidden and Kneecap needed those strong performances if they wanted to solidify themselves when it comes to the top eight, but then we make it into our final match here of the PLQ for EMEA, and it was rolling teams who just played it so smart and slow. They knew that they needed to have a standout performance here. They were right on the bubble heading into this match, and they didn't want to take any chances. They played from that north side, were able to clear out Apex Warlords, and continued rolling through everybody that was below them as these final moments progressed. They were able to get down to a 3v1v1, which is ideal for any squad, clearing out DN first. And the last solo was Kneecap, the team that had done well getting that second place finish the game before, so that Rat able to get some points on the board for themselves when it comes to the placement points. No kills, but that's okay. Rolling teams coming through with eight kills for a total of 20. So all of these teams trying to put in work in those final moments when they needed it. Trojan also having a strong performance here, and they were another squad looking to stay in that top eight here Vicky yeah I'm even thinking how big of a, of a factor that kneecap that solos surviving till second place was because they were in seventh I believe before that game so all those extra points even without KP that's necessary for a last game like that and even going all the way down to free Sosa can those six points be enough I mean they were on the bottom end of the leaderboard so probably not but that final game was crazy to see how that really shifted the play style for a lot of these teams well, we'll take a look at the second page as well so we can see what some of these other squads were able to do. Now, I'm specifically thinking about Call Me Data and MPC, some of these teams that were right on that bubble alongside uh, rolling teams. And it's just when you see them get these low points with just how close the overall standings were, it starts to get a little bit sad because literally we talked about this. Teams were separated by one point here. We had ties throughout those overall totals heading into this final match here at Gaskin. And so we'll take a look to see what happened here with our series results. And this is where all the money and all the marbles are won. There's your top eight for Pro League. Players take eighth position. Kneecap, Rolling Teams, Forbidden, Apex Warlords, Trojan, Danish, and Red Dragon. And as we knew, seeing three of the Pro League teams already eliminated yesterday, we were guaranteed to have some challenger teams, but a couple more have snuck in at the same time. Congratulations to those who have made it. Commiserations to those who did not quite make it. As you mentioned, CMD and Atlas, they were, they were up there. NPC, they were all there or thereabouts and in the mixer but then in match six is when things just went down the plug hole a little bit and sadly they couldn't stay in that top eight and you can see just how close that bubble area was too i mean 32 points to 31 
to 30. It couldn't have been any closer. A lot of these teams put on some really strong performances here today, Vicky. But at the end of the day, we now have our top eight. And the ones that did make it there absolutely deserved it. Yeah, I mean, especially after looking at a team not only hit match point after two games, but then take it back to back, you have to imagine how that could kind of put a dent to certain individuals' mentals. But being strong and understanding what happened and what you have to do next, since that's one less team in the lobby to worry about, that's what a lot of these teams were able to do when it came to shifting that focus going forward with the rest of the series. Yeah, now obviously lots of uh, standout performances from teams and individuals that we saw here today. But we have to pick an MVP. And I feel like this might be a little bit obvious after what we saw going on here today, but there's no way that we wouldn't pick at least someone from Red Dragon. And who better to pick when it comes to MVP than Taskmaster, okay? A player we became very familiar with during the Fire Beavers era now. One of three to make PLQ history and hit match point in two and then close it out in three. I mean, they came in having one challenger circuit number four and they absolutely dominated the competition they only played three matches today and taskmaster had over 4700 damage with 11 kills playing on that bangalore absolutely fragging out for the squad i, I mean you can't say enough about taskmaster but i do want to give a little bit of love to the rest of the squad as well because both prestis and seven Ozzes also were at 13 and 12 kills respectively with over 5300 and 4k damage of their own overall they were just an indomitable force coming into the competition here today and considering uh taskmaster if i if i'm not mistaken was nominated as one of the three best slayers after algs season one by esports.gg you see why okay you can see why so for me it had to be taskmaster but like i said it could have truly been anybody on that squad because it was a phenomenal, phenomenal performance. But now is a time that we, where we get to actually talk with one of our players who performed well here during PLQ. And Dan, you said it yourself, it would not be a pro league without Shiv. We had to get Shiv in so we could get an interview. First of all, Shiv, congratulations on making your way back into split two. How's the squad feeling right now? Uh, I mean, we're feeling ecstatic. I mean, we, we, we made it, you know, we made it. So, um, yeah, just absolutely amazing. Feels good to be back, you know, that's for sure. What's up, guys? <clears throat> and I, I saw you, you made a team change, you made a team name change, 40% worse was dropped, you're back to the Apex Warlords. <laughs> does, uh, does that have an impact on how you played? What was the decision there? Had to for the culture, you know, Apex Warlords, of course, we had to do it for the culture. <laughs> of course, that's the name right there. I got to represent the the Warlords, you know, so yeah. And uh, yeah, it's a nice name for sure. A little bit of a confidence booster, that's, that's for sure, I guess, with the name too. So it's nice. I, I have to ask you, you know, exiting out of, of what we saw between Split 1 and now you guys with the come up, Zerifer was popping off today. We saw the whole thing, front row tickets. Um, how are you feeling mental-wise, though, as you prepare for Split 2 Pro League? Are you feeling like there's going to be a hard reset for you and your team? There's probably going to be a patch, obviously, between that now and then. Um, are you going to be approaching Split 2 Pro League with a clean mindset, or are you going to take remnants of what happened between Split 1 and then take control over that for this next upcoming Split? Uh, I mean, we'll we'll definitely move forward with a we'll, we'll, yeah with a clean reset, but we'll, we'll take what we learned as well a little bit from split one two. There's certain things we can um, move forward, uh, you know, learning from from split one and, and move forward here. Of course, the the, um, the comps and everything, the metas change drastically, so there's that too. But um, yeah, there's there's a lot to think about too going to to split two for sure. But we'll go in there with a you know fresh fresh mind and full reset and yeah we'll go for it yeah all right all right shiv i want to pick your brain a little bit here obviously we had a lot happen throughout split one and now we have uh playoffs right around the corner do you have any predictions for how land might go will the trophy change hands into a third team's name like what, what do you think 
Oh, I mean, okay. I mean, it, it could. I think it could switch to another team's uh, uh, name. I haven't really been following much with uh, with how everything's going, scrims, scrim wise, and uh, and all of uh, pro league and everything. But um, or like, yeah, how scrims are going. But uh, yeah, I mean, it could. Yeah, I guess it could have the potential to switch to another team's uh, team's hands here. Another team could could take it. I think. Uh, for sure. Well, there's a lot of teams that have been performing well. And today we mm -hmm. saw Red Dragon absolutely dominate the competition. I mean, unprecedented. We saw a team win in three games here. What's it like being part of a lobby when you see that happen? And what's the mindset of your team when you're like, oh, someone's just won in three games, but we still have three games to play here? Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, Red Dragon played absolutely amazing. Like they're, they're absolutely, you know, rolling and, and farming the lobbies. But yeah. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, either way, after the you know last three games, uh, we just got to lock it in, keep focused, and um, yeah, keep trying to stay consistent, get some points on the board, and uh, you, know, um, you know, finish it, finish strong, and keep going, maintaining, getting points on the board for sure. Just keep going, no matter what. Just stay, stay focused. All right, Shiv. Well, we're about to let you go because I don't want to keep you too long. But before I do, do you have any shout outs that you want to do for anybody? um shout out everyone who who watched the games i hope you all enjoyed all, all the games also uh to my teammate zeri absolute legend he, he's also been having issues with like uh you know carpal tunnel injuries and stuff so that's a tough one so big shout out to my teammate also to ganji my teammate but yeah to everyone watching uh everyone who's rooting for us and um yeah that, that's it shout out to all you guys absolute legends for watching that's it all right, Shiv. Well, thank you so much for your time. Congratulations again, and uh, we'll be hearing from you soon. Yep. Thank you, thank you. Yep, 100%. Always nice to be able to chat with Shiv. Uh, really strong performance out of Apex Warlords today. We saw some really strong performances uh, across the board from a lot of teams that we I think we had some pretty high expectations for and then also some some new faces that we'll be able to start talking about when that new split comes around the corner but give me your final thoughts here on the day Gaskin we'll start with you well I'm just trying to count how many challenger teams we have but I mean at least three if not four there just from what I can see congratulations to those who have been grinding through challenger circuit to try and be in the pro league welcome to the big leagues and I'm excited to see how they perform when we do get into split two but also we've got LAN around the corner can't wait for playoffs it's going to be incredible and today was a brilliant day we saw something very new we saw a team win in three matches which we've not seen in this region before so we'll have to see whether Red Dragon can make an impact in split two I like it. I like it. Vicky, what, what were some of your favorite moments and thoughts on the day? Uh, honestly, echoing from what Dan said, uh, the Challenger Circuit teams have been playing for so long now to finally go all out for this weekend where they had to play eight games back to back, basically, until they finally reached the finals. Congratulations to the Challenger Circuit teams, especially who have been able to make it through to participate in the Split 2 Pro League. And I'll see y'all, Lan. I can't wait to see Lan. It's going to be amazing. Split 1 playoffs is right around the corner, and I literally cannot wait to be there with you guys. Yeah, I think everybody is insanely excited. Well, fantastic job here today. Mark, Dan, and Vicky, you guys killed it as always. But this is just EMEA, okay? We still need to find out which of our teams will clinch out the available Pro League spots, but this time in NA. Make sure you come back here at 3 p.m. PT, 6 p.m. ET to see what happens next. Will we get another history-making match point, or will we see a closer back and forth amongst our NA squads? Either way, it's sure to be an exciting way to close out our PLQ action for today as always if you missed any of what happened here today or you can't make it to NA later you can always just follow us on social media at play apex esports on x and youtube or at play apex on twitch and that way you won't miss a single second of our algs action and speaking of algs action we keep mentioning it okay don't forget our split one playoffs are right around the corner and trust me when i tell you that an apex land is unlike any other if you want to see all of the action unfold in person all you have to do is other, no other other direction I, we're in we're mirrored okay there's cameras here just scan the qr code get your tickets there and then we'll be able to see how it all goes in just a week and a half i don't even know how it's that close already but for now it's time for a short break before we head into the next region for plq so go grab those tickets get yourself some snacks and stay hydrated we'll see you back here in just a few hours